Good evening. It's Monday, April 8th, and it's an exciting day. It's probably the first time we've had an eclipse and a meeting of the Planning and Development Committee on the, on the same day. Madam Clerk, do we have any regrets? Councillor, she has regrets for tonight. Thank you. And any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. All right, looking for a couple of councillors to take us into the Committee of the Whole. Councillors Lischina and Adams, thank you. All in favor? And that is carried. Council, we have three consent items this evening. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any registered delegations to speak to any of these? No, we do not. Thank you. So. How would you like to deal with these? Councillor Delongo? Move to accept the three of them? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Oh, Councillor Grant, yes, thank you. You've had uh, Just a, a minor note, uh, 4.1 uh, is noting the wrong ward. It mentions ward three, it's ward five. Very minor housekeeping issue. Thank you very much. Housekeeping. We move to 4.3. I'm sorry, that was moved. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we just need um, a vote on all three, please. Oh, all those in favor. And that's unanimous. We do not have any confidential consent items. We don't have any public hearing items. We do have a few discussion items. 7.1, the community planning permit system. Uh, Ms. Von Kersel, I believe you have an introduction for us. Yes, hello, good evening council. Uh, Mayor Burton, I uh, just wanted to wish Mayor Burton a happy birthday. I remembered it's his birthday today. Um, so you may remember me from a few weeks ago. I was up here presenting on the um, um, white paper, Planning Act tools to facilitate affordable housing. And at that time, I did mention that we would be coming back to give you a presentation regarding the community planning permit system. So I'm very happy to let you know that Justine Giancola from Dillon Consulting will be making this presentation for you. Um, and she will be here to present on uh, how the community planning permit system is a tool for community building. And she'll also be able to answer some of your questions with respect to the tool. Justine has made many presentations on the community planning permit system as well as other planning act tools in her capacity as both a professional registered planner and a partner at Dillon Consulting. She, uh, she's also been um, a past president of the Ontario Professional Planners Institute, and, uh, and she's considered one of the top policy advisors uh, at Dillon Consulting, working especially with municipalities to implement various planning tools, including updating official plans, undertaking zoning bylaws, preparing secondary plans for strategic growth areas, and also working with communities to develop the community planning permit system. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over the podium to Justine, and uh, I hope that the, you'll find this presentation helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Sabelle. Um, just a quick check to make sure my audio is coming in clearly. It certainly is. Fantastic. Um, thank you for having me, um, and uh, thank you to members of council, to staff, um, and happy birthday to Mayor Burton. I hope it was uh, memorable with the eclipse today. Um, I also appreciate you uh, accommodating me virtually. The eclipse did add some logistical challenges, so I um, do appreciate you accommodating me virtually today. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, what we're hoping to kind of go over today is a little bit of how some other municipalities across the province are using community, community planning permit systems, or I'll refer to them as a CPPS uh, for a shorter acronym. Um, 
And uh, some of these are based on firsthand experience working with those municipalities directly. Um, some of them are based on uh, interviews that we've done with the municipalities that have the tool um, or from uh, municipalities that we're working with actively to develop the tool. Um, so there will be some that we're discussing that are in force and effect and some that are um, uh, in the process. And I'm hoping that um, this presentation can provide value to the town of Oakville as you're looking to um, progress your community building objectives um, across the town. On the next slide, I'll just quickly go over uh, a brief agenda. Um, picking up on Sibel's presentation that she did previously, um, I won't be spending a lot of time going over what a CPPS is or how it works, um, but really doing a deeper dive on how um, others are using it uh, to try to achieve community objectives. And we'll spend a little bit of time on municipal best practices in uh, um, adopting and implementing a CPPS and happy to uh, stick around um, for any discussions or, or questions after the presentation. If we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, so as part of the overview of CPPS, uh, the next slide will just um, kind of briefly touch on um, some core elements of the tool that build off of Sibel's presentation. Um, on the next slide, you'll see uh, that a community planning permit system is a tool to regulate land. And it's available to municipalities across the province, has been available since 2007, um, and ultimately implements a municipality's official plan. So it is at that level um, below policy where it is a land use regulation tool um, that defines the uh, parameters that control development. It provides one application and one, one approval process, which can streamline development approvals for municipalities, as well as for the proponent. And can, it can facilitate a faster overall approval time um, where applications meet the standards required by the bylaw itself. While this tool has been available since 2007, um, there have been a few um, adjustments to the regulations since then. And uh, the current um, community planning permit system, it was formerly known as a development permit system, so DPS, just an, another acronym to throw out there. Um, but fundamentally, the legislation um, has been fairly consistent in terms of um, the elements of the tool that are required to be implemented. And the tool is currently regulated by OREG 173-16. And over the past several, over the past decade, there are, the CPPS tool has gained a fair bit of traction across municipalities in Ontario as our collective understanding of the tool is increasing and continues to evolve. One of the main um, changes that were introduced in Bill 108 um, allows both the minister to establish a community planning permit system in order for certain geographies. And given the recent legislative changes, including Bill 108's modifications to the Planning Act timelines, um, increasing delegations to staff, Bill 109 introducing the need to refund fees, um, and Bill 23 sweeping changes to the development approval process, um, including third-party appeals to minor variances, and uh, what a site plan can, control can cover. There's a number of municipalities that right now are looking at this tool um, with a lot of uh, increased interest. On the next slide, I'll quickly go over um, some of the core differences that this tool provides compared to um, a traditional process. So where our community planning permit system um, is used, it is implemented through a community planning permit bylaw. So the official plan establishes the enabling policies and then ultimately is a C CPP bylaw that's implemented. Um, you can think about it similar to a zoning bylaw where it would have a number of permitted uses, it would have administrative text, it would have um, outline of uh, various different geographies. And typically instead of zones, we call them precincts or districts to just not confuse things further by using the same term. Um, it is... Uh, it regulates land use similar to a zoning bylaw and can establish permitted uses and development standards on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, that could include things like setbacks for buildings, building heights, number of residential units on a lot, um, setback from water, and various different other parking provisions um, and, uh, and other things that you would be used to through a zoning bylaw. Where it, it's uh, a little different is that it does combine, um, it establishes the variations 
um, that could be used within the bylaw itself. So it covers the minor variance process, um, as well as site plan agreement. So it covers the site plan control process in, in a single application um, and a single um, permit. So the community planning permit bylaw may include details as well um, on site alteration, grading, and tree removal, and natural features protection. And that's because the definition of development under community planning permit systems is broader than the definition of development under site plan control. So you're, there's an ability for a municipality to control more through a single process, um, given the definition of development by the tool. It also allows municipalities to look at um, other items such as urban design criteria, heritage character, and community benefits. And I'll get into each one of those in a little bit more detail in a moment. The other thing I wanted to highlight is just that um, public and stakeholder engagement is, is typically front-ended. So that means it's um, necessary and uh, really important in order to establish the rules that go into the bylaw itself. Those rules of development control what is a threshold for um, a development application and how it gets treated in the process, and that that public engagement is needed to set those rules. Once those rules are in place, the bylaw itself establishes any additional public notice requirements for public um, engagement. There's no minimum requirements from the legislation itself. A municipality may define them through the bylaw. On the next slide, um, I'll go into a little bit more about what I was referring to in terms of classes of development. So a community planning permit bylaw can establish classes of development. And this is, again, um, there's an opportunity for municipalities to do this. And uh, what I've got on the slide is an example from other municipalities, but there's nothing in the legislation saying you have to set it up this way. Um, I merely want to show an example of how others have set it up. So um, what, you, what um, others have looked at is um, threshold um, for various different classes of development, criteria and conditions that could be established for each class. And while council is the assigned approval authority of development applications, um, a community planning permit bylaw may identify where um, approvals will be delegated to staff or a committee of council. And typically this is based on the class of development. And in my experience, most mun municipalities have decided to delegate um, development permit applications that fit within the kind of as of right or class one, as I'm showing on the screen here, category. Um, which are intended to have met all the requirements of the bylaw themselves um, and can be a verification as opposed to um, meeting um, uh, principle of land use discussion. If I um, look at the kind of the three examples here, um, class one does pick up that as of right permission. And so it does not require additional demonstration of criteria being met. Um, and it's simply a confirmation that the established bylaw requirements have been provided. A second class is often used um, to pick up some minor variations and discretionary uses. You can think about this perhaps as the adoption of the, adoption of the minor variance process, um, but it is different. The tool does have um, uh, certainly a lot more flexibility because the bylaw itself establishes what do I want the threshold for staff for, for these variations to be. So um, typically municipalities, um, depending on the development standard, might have something from five up to potentially 50% of a standard, depending on what that standard is. And they allow a variation, um, but that variation is tied to specific criteria in the bylaw or conditions. And this could be um, something uh, unlike in the minor variance process where we use provincially established um, tests of a minor variance, the municipality actually defines, here's the criteria that matters to us, and this is what we're going to include. So you have the ability to establish the rules and the threshold of what um, variations will be considered within the bylaw itself. Typically there's a third class, sometimes there's a fourth, um, but Typically, it's kind of two to, to four uh, overall classes. And the third class picks up anything above that threshold. And um, generally, uh, in that class, um, generally, this would be a, a council or committee approval. 
Um, most municipalities have allowed um, up to a hundred percent of the development provision. Some of them, maybe it's a little less, um, but again, some have this on every single development standard. Some it's a catch-all um, provision in the bylaw. And the intent is to say, what is the range of development applications do we, that we want to still um, be able to capture through the community planning permit bylaw itself? Because anything outside of that range requires a bylaw amendment. And that is a, a full process public in, uh, public engagement requirements, public notice requirements, and a much lengthier process. So really, this third class is intended to capture the broad range of um, anything above that class two threshold that you want to still work within the range of development possibilities that the bylaw can capture itself. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, similar to site plan control, the bylaw may establish a range of conditions of approval that may be required to be satisfied before a per permit is issued or an application can be um, proceed to building permit. And uh, they can be required to enter into an agreement similar to section um, 70.2 of the Planning Act, and it could be required to be registered on title. Um, so you don't kind of lose anything from that perspective. Um, let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit more about how others have used the tool. And if you can go ahead and jump one further slide, um, this tool is commonly used in other parts of Canada. It's referred to typically as a development permit system um, in other parts of Canada. Um, you know, municipalities in British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia have used some version of this tool for years. Um, but it is, they do work under a different legislative process. So they're, they're, it's not the same by any means, but there have been some um, good abilities to kind of learn from those processes and, and use of the tool elsewhere. Um, and they are ultimately designating a permit and issuing um, permits to a development application. So it's been um, great to bring in some uh, Western and uh, Eastern Canadian experience uh, into this context. In Ontario, um, this tool is still fairly underutilized. Um, and there are, however, a number of municipalities currently looking at um, additional ways to set up the tool and meet their community objectives. And so on the next slide, I'll quickly um, go over kind of some of the municipalities that are using an area-specific approach, while others are using a municipal-wide bylaw right um, from the, uh, well, I guess some of them are not right from the beginning. They transition from area-specific to municipal-wide, um, but where they do have a municipal-wide bylaw, I've captured them under there. So each municipality that uses the tool to date has done so in a different manner based on their community needs and priorities. Some of the early adop adopters saw the benefit it provided through the broader definition of development, which includes site alteration and vegetation removal, and use it for shoreline preservation. And that would include Lake of Bays and, and Innisfil's R Shore. Others saw a real benefit to addressing heritage and design matters. Um, you know, example would be Brampton for their Main Street and, and uh, use of it on Main Street. And several others really saw the benefit regarding application processing and went right to a town-wide or municipal-wide bylaw such as Gannon-Aqua, Carlton Place. Um, and I do note on the side, I'm sorry, I had a typo. Carlton Place is, has been using the, a bylaw since 2008. Um, they have modified it as recently as 2021, uh, but they have been using it since 2008. Um, and uh, sorry, Huntsville also went this way, where they went uh, municipal-wide bylaw right from the beginning in an effort to um, streamline development applications and, and not have two separate systems running across the municipality. Um, Innisville is also expanding their community planning permit system to be townwide, with the first phase picking up the R shore that they've already um, ha have under the system and Alcona as their priority growth area. And Burlington, um, the city of Burlington is the first municipality to use the tool for a strategic growth area. Um, and following uh, uh, in their footsteps, um, uh, the city of Waterloo and city of Peterborough are also in the process of doing the same um, at the much earlier stages of that process. We're also working with the Township of King on their community planning permits system for their core areas, and that's at the early stage as well. And there's a number of other municipalities that have um, done a direction report, contemplated a tool, have some enabling policies, uh, but have yet to establish the bylaw. 
So on the next slide, I'll just um, provide a brief overview of some of the difference, the benefits of doing area specific versus uh, municipal wide bylaw. Um, in terms of uh, benefits, it really just depends on kind of where you want to spend your time and effort. And um, certainly the benefits of having an area specific bylaw would be to allow um, you to focus on your priority growth areas first. And you can then phase in uh, the change management component because this is fundamentally a brand new tool for the municipality and does have a big change management component associated with it. Um, and it will allow then to, um, to really focus that effort in those priority areas. A key benefit for a municipal-wide um, bylaw would be to have a single system that you're running across the municipality. So any development application that comes in um, is being um, controlled by the single bylaw. It defines a process and it's consistently being applied across the municipality. Um, so it certainly helps with some of the kind of confusion on the on the external side when someone comes in and wants to know more about um, what provisions apply to their property and you have multiple bylaws for different areas, um, but also internally in terms of running staff for two different systems for different geographies. On the next slide, I will, um, we're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive on, on these bylaws, but do so in a way where we're focusing on some of the community objectives that they're trying to achieve. And if we can go uh, next, we'll spend a little time talking about how others have used a community planning permit system or are trying to use one right now to um, achieve priority community objectives. I'll be touching on community facilities, parkland, mixed use targets, affordable housing targets, sustainability me measures, urban design, natural heritage, coordination with infrastructure, and then try to share some examples from other municipalities in terms of the implementation process as well um, that could be helpful. And since some of these um, are uh, still in progress, um, what I'll be sharing is um, any information that is part of draft bylaws, and I'll try to state where it is a draft and not enforce an effect because um, there is still ongoing process and where the final bylaw lands could be a little bit different than what I'm presenting today. On the next slide, we'll, we'll start with community facilities. So community facilities is a general term at, and often includes, we think about things like libraries, daycare facilities, public art, energy conservation measures, parkland, um, beyond what's required in the Planning Act, and the list goes on and on. And so a community planning permit system allows a municipality to secure those essential community facilities um, in a few different ways. So the first way is similar to um, zoning bylaw, where you can have permitted uses um, and you might permit institutional uses in several different, um, I'll say precincts instead of zones, several different areas across the municipality. You might permit public service facilities in those in a number of different geographies, um, infrastructure as a, a permission in all um, zones, in this case, precincts. Unlike zoning, you also have the ability to define discretionary uses, and those discretionary uses could come with either conditions or criteria to evaluate whether a discretionary use will be permitted. And so you know, if you take the example of a daycare facility, you could say um, a daycare facility could be discretionary for certain geographies or if certain conditions have been met, such as, you know, um, the need for um, any um, conformity, um, sorry, um, associated uses. So these are not considered as of right and require a variation to the permit itself. Um, the, and, and it's particularly helpful as it relates to land use compatibility, because you can try to um, manage land use compatibility challenges in that way. Another element that's different than zoning is that um, OREG 173-16 allows uh, municipalities to identify facility services and matters in exchange for height and density within and beyond the minimum and maximum standards of the bylaw. And so um, what that means is that I use the term facility services and matters. I know it's a mouthful that's directly from the legislation. Um, often other communities just use community benefit. Um, so uh, perhaps I can use that language if, if that's a little bit easier. Um, and uh, fundamentally under CPPS, 
a community benefits charge does not apply. And so the bylaw itself needs to establish where those community benefits or facility services and matters will be required. And so um, one other thing that's interesting is that um, a community benefits charge does not apply to 10 units or less, 10 residential units or less, where a CPP bylaw may apply to any form of development. And then again, similar to site plan control, a municipality can identify conditions that need to be satisfied and can specify um, agreements that need to be um, registered on title um, or other conditions that may be applicable to um, the securing community amenities and facilities. And so Huntsville, as an example, um, as part of their um, uh, class three, which would be the kind of uh, negotiated um, permit um, it's above the class two threshold and it's the open negotiated permit that goes to council. Um, they require community benefits in exchange for additional height and density and um, land for municipal services and active transportation facilities are listed as things the municipality um, could request in exchange for additional height and density. Burlington, um, uh, as part of their uh, OP draft OP and community planning permit bylaw, um, are, they're including conceptual locations for new parks, potential linear parks and greenways um, coming out of their area specific plans. And that's what you're seeing kind of on this side here. And the bylaw requires that um, facilities, services and matters um, be no, uh, requires thresholds for all development applications. Um, and uh, it notes the need to um, uh, contribute towards complete communities, which would be similar to a community benefits charge, um, as well as uh, alignment with pub the public realm figures that you're seeing on, on this um, diagram here. On the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more about parkland. So parkland can be achieved through um, the current municipal parkland bylaw, section 42 of the Planning Act, um, as well as through facility services and matters under the community planning permit bylaw. And um, Innisfil, for example, uh, which is the example on your screen here um, from our shore, their shoreline um, community planning permit system includes parkland and municipal park improvements as a list of possible community benefits that they can um, obtain. Again, that would be as part of that additional height density in the kind of negotiated class three um, development application. Um, Huntsville has a very similar um, uh, list of things and includes in theirs additional parkland above the Planning Act requirements. Um, and uh, Burlington um, draft bylaw proposes a framework for additional parkland dedication in accordance with the city's park provisioning master plan service level needs. On the next slide, let's look at a little bit about uh, mixed use targets. So many municipalities are struggling with the concept of pre-zoning for their strategic growth areas. Recognizing that when you add an as of right permission for residential um, in our current uh, market, it's very difficult to um, get all the other communities that you have, whether that's jobs, the services, amenities that your future residents will need in those areas. And there's a fear that um, if the land's gone and used for residential and ultimately um, put it like private, then you won't be able to get it back later. And so one of the things that um, the community planning permit system can do um, is look at using discretionary uses and criteria in a unique way. And I think this could be applicable to some of the challenges that you guys faced in North Oakville, where, um, you know, in many instances, we see that um, community facilities and non-residential uses follow or stagger after the residential uses. And so um, the need to preserve that land is so critical. Um, at, when you're at the planning stage. So on your screen here, you'll see an example from the city of Burlington draft um, community planning permit bylaw, um, where uh, the objective is to encourage both employment and residential growth in the major transit station areas, while supporting land use compatibility in these areas as they change over time. And so one method of trying to achieve this goal is to use, strategically use discretionary uses in certain precincts and only allow residential after certain conditions have been met. And one such condition could be sufficient employment gross floor area or land use compatibility with an adjacent use or surrounding use doesn't have to be adjacent. 
So um, the ability to use a discretionary use um, allows a municipality to, to uh, control and provide parameters for when that use could be permitted, but it's not permitted as a right. And this, I think, has um, a lot of potential as it relates to um, trying to secure that land early on in the process. Um, a couple other things that Burlington is doing that might be applicable here is in uh, Appleby, where they where there's uh, a number of existing major facilities. I'm trying to tie these specifically to um, demonstration that land use compatibility requirements have been met and um, any mitigation or, or management um, has been um, achieved and potentially even agreement registered on title. Again, that there's those options of how, how best to deal with it. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, let's jump to the next slide and we'll go into the housing piece a little bit more. So um, a number of municipalities are struggling with how to manage um, and uh, secure affordable housing, attainable housing um, to meet not only your, your current needs, but your future needs as, as the municipality continues to grow. And so um, a number, the, the uh, we're looking at how to use facility services and matters. Um, again, I'll refer to it as community benefits um, in exchange for additional height and density. And so a number of municipalities have done that as part of the kind of um, the class three um, negotiated development application. Burlington is trying to take it one step further and recognizing the recent housing strategy that um, Dylan undertook for the city there's an urgent need for affordable and attainable housing. And that um, given that there's significant growth going into the major transit station areas, this area really is a priority to secure affordable and attainable housing units. So the draft community planning permit bylaw um, was uh, looking to establish a framework to provide expectations for all applications as it relates to facility services and matters based on maximum height thresholds. And um, the draft bylaw uh, included components um, outlined on the slide with the intent of a little bit of a kind of, um, for lack of a better term, choose your own adventure. So to have a range of parameters um, that uh, meet the, the city's objectives as it relates to affordable housing and their overall affordable housing target, but having um, flexibility to apply it to a various different um, range of applications and the objective here was really, um, you know, recognizing that the, the negotiated kind of open-ended list of all the things that a municipality may take for height and density um, is a tool that's well-established and, and other municipalities have used, um, but that the um, development industry needed a clear understanding of how to get to um, the maximum height threshold um, that went along with the, um, the, the variation. And so um, in an effort to establish that framework, um, uh, a clear direction as to what a municipality would take um, or could request in order to achieve the maximum heights was needed. On the next slide, let's go into the sustainability measures in a little bit. So um, requirements for development uh, that provides specific sustainability measures, for example, beyond, above the building permit minimums, can be incorporated right into the bylaw, um, whether through objectives, um, criteria for variation, or conditions of approval, as well as through facilities, services, and matters. And so um, a number of municipalities have uh, incorporated it, um, a number of different measures in different ways um, that allow a municipality to um, not, not just uh, make certain um, requests up front, but also um, establish more teeth towards uh, sustainability guidelines, if you have guidelines, um, or requiring specific measures um, through the bylaw itself. So Innisfil R Shores, for example, has guiding principles. Um, they have a sustainable values uh, guiding principle that talks about erosion control, flooding, natural hazards, this is the shoreline, um, and they link um, their conditions to um, their, those guiding principles. So, um, any, and they can um, impose 
uh, requirement on a permit application based on those conditions. Um, Huntsville similarly established a outline of their um, community benefits that they will um, that they may ask for in exchange for additional height and density. And again, that includes specific uh, sustainable design features that they can um, request or uh, or take in, in exchange for um, height and density. Carlton Place um, has included a, a condition of approval for um, grading or um, alternatives with uh, consideration for low impact development and green infrastructure. And they've stated that right in their list of conditions they may um, require for an application. While Burlington does have um, health, healthy and greener city as one of their objectives, covering carbon neutrality, sustainable building measures, green infrastructure related to energy, water, landscaping, and waste to address climate change. And they've also proposed some specific um, parking reductions to help um, support their overall sustainability strategy and um, to introduce bicycle parking requirements, EV parking requirements, and accessible parking needs um, and add flexibility in how parking minimums are applied. Um, so that's another element of how they've taken those kind of objectives and tried to put it in the parameters of the bylaw itself. On the next slide, we'll touch on urban design. So um, through a defined precinct, um, you, a municipality may identify specific design requirements in the bylaw itself um, or could uh, reference um, urban design guidelines and incentivize alignment with those guidelines. So an example would be um, Huntsville, where the criteria for variation um, specifically outlines the need to align with the municipality's urban design guidelines, if, if applicable. Um, another interesting way of using a tool would be in Burlington, um, where they've looked at um, a specific element of design and tried to um, where, where zoning has some limitations on trying to provide different methods of achieving the objective, they're trying to do this through the provision itself in the bylaw. So let me give you an example. So building transition. We, um, we know that building transition is really important in, in priority areas where we go from you know, hot, taller buildings to um, existing residential neighborhoods. And um, you know, municipalities often get pushed back on the 45 degree angular plane. So there's an ability to establish the objective of that provision. And then to say, if you can't provide 35 degree angular plane, then here's some other methods to achieve that objective. We can look at an increased side yard step back. We can look at building step back. We can reduce the building massing, or perhaps there's an, uh, another approach that, um, that the municipality can accept. So this provides through the bylaw itself different methods to achieve those design objectives um, in the provision itself or the variations that you're accepting. Lake of Bays also includes built form criteria for each community planning permit area um, and uh, variation, including building height, massing, density established by activity area in appendices of the bylaw. Um, and certainly, again, in Aukway, um, their uh, development permit system bylaw includes a number of design criteria um, specific to permit areas. So there are many different examples of how municipalities have incorporated design criteria into the bylaw itself. Um, and that's certainly continuing to evolve as uh, new municipalities are, are picking up this, bylaw, this approach. Um, on the next slide, I'll touch on natural heritage, um, uh, protecting natural heritage elements uh, through um, certainly the broader definition of site alteration, uh, uh, sorry, broader definition of development, including site alteration and vegetation removal, um, does allow, puts municipalities in a better position to protect natural heritage and um, against natural hazards. Um, I mean, Lake of Bays, for example, in their bylaw includes a standalone section on vegetation removal and site alteration. Um, and the requirements for replacing trees, for example, um, including minimum tree height and tree stock. And Innisfil Shoreline has a, has a, a similar section um, where they have a minimum tree height and specific requirements 
for um, eco ecologically sound and safe development practices along Lake Simcoe shoreline, um, while Carlton Place has a specific tree replacement ratio in the bylaw itself. Um, so there's a number of parameters just relating to kind of broadening that definition of development and incorporating tree preservation through the same single permit process. Huntsville, um, the, the example that you have in front of you here is from Huntsville, and they use um, conservation precinct, flood zone precinct, and floodway precinct, um, which are, you know, what we would consider zones. Um, they're precincts, you know, solid line on a map. Um, and then they also have overlays, uh, uh, natural conservation overlay one and two. And these combinations of those parameters allow a municipality to have different provisions that apply to different areas. And um, by doing so, they can identify where development is permitted, where it's not permitted, and where it's permitted subject to a variety of different conditions and requirements. On the next slide, um, the last piece I want to touch on is just around infrastructure service delivery. And we know that um, several municipalities have established conditions of approval, specifically around coordination and development with infrastructure. Um, and this is, um, you know, one of the one of the um, key things to to note through those conditions is, you know, while the approval time is forty five days. Um, there is an ability to identify, you know, these are the conditions of approval and those conditions could be required before the permit is issued or before an application can be, um, can proceed to building permit. So there is an ability to um, uh, address the coordination with infrastructure um, through those tools on um, conditions of approval or what's sometimes referred to as provisional approval. So, Let's uh, get into the last section here. I know this is a lot of information and um, I'm doing a really um, quick dive on like 15 different bylaws. So your head may be spinning and I'm sorry if that's the case. Um, but I did want to spend a little bit of time, just a couple minutes on kind of the implementation of the bylaw. And then I'm happy to kind of pick away at any of these components that I breezed over. Um, in terms of um, implementation, the, sorry, if we can progress uh, two slides, thank you so much. Um, in terms of successful measures to engage uh, community and stakeholders, this is in the bylaw preparation itself. Itself, Certainly community engagement is needed up front. Um, it's needed to help develop the bylaw. It's needed to help establish the official plan policies um, that are required uh, enabling policies and to establish you know, what should the thresholds be for various different classes of development? What should the criteria be and conditions um, that we associate with those variations? Ultimately, all the rules of development get defined by the bylaw. And so that's why public and community and stakeholder engagement in the preparation of the bylaw is so essential. When we're assisting the town of Huntsville, um, they established a stakeholder advisory group to kind of work through each steps of the process. And similarly, Innisville has a community advisory group um, that they're using to uh, bring drafts of the bylaw to and work through the process. Um, City of Burlington, following its um, six, a little over six year process in establishing the area specific plans, had a a, a long and very robust public engagement process that went into the major transit station area, um, area specific plans. And then um, as part of the uh, community planning permit uh, bylaw development itself, um, additional engagement was included around um, chamber of commerce meetings, um, additional open houses, drop-in sessions, several stakeholder meetings, um, and several uh, uh, stakeholder meetings with major industry and developers to kind of work through very specific issues. And so it is really important that that public engagement and stakeholder engagement is front-ended and it's done in a comprehensive manner. Um, the bylaw itself is appealable. Um, and so that engagement is really essential. On the next slide, I'll just go through a few of the kind of best practices as it relates to drafting the bylaw itself. Um, what we heard from others uh, in interviews and, and through um, some of the processes that we've worked on is um, that we need to be very um, 
given that you only know the future, you only know the things to ask now, like we don't know exactly all, all the ways the future is going to go. So the parameters that you work within, you need to add some flexibility. Um, you know, the way you define a use today, we know it's going to be different than, way, than the way you find, define a use in the future. And so, you know, Lake of Bays said, you know, make sure you always include similar use to the use permitted. So like you are not um, inadvertently requiring someone to do a bylaw amendment for something that you would otherwise intended to be captured within the bylaw itself. Um, in working with Huntsville through some of their implementation, you know, they said that, like, make sure your list of conditions is a thorough list. You can't think of all the things you might want to provide a conditional approval on. Like, make sure it's a comprehensive and thorough list from the beginning, because that indicates all the parameters that you can, you can use to help um, get to the 45-day the timeline and recognize that there might be um, elements that need to be uh, reviewed afterwards, and, and um, it provides the municipality with that ability to do so. Um, the, uh, in, um, in talking to uh, Gananoque and Carlton Place, they um, referred to, you know, the importance of public engagement right up front. Um, they had a number of targeted meetings with lawyers and developers, contractors, real estate agents early on in the process. Um, and really looked at, you know, if we're going to do area specific requirements, we need to make sure that they define the, the character of the area and, and again, provide some um, control the things that matter most to this municipality. Um, I'm happy to take questions now or wait till the end. Um, is there, wait, till, okay, sorry. Um, and then the, the last piece I wanted to mention here is just around, um, measures to implement the community planning permit system once it's in effect. And so um, the 45 days is a short timeline. And so the need to really think through the class structure and what is a reasonable threshold for um, approval, uh, approval authority is really important. I think once this is in effect, there is a big internal change management exercise needed. There's external change management exercise needed. Um, and so uh, you know, thinking that through in terms of um, uh, getting some support and assistance through that, I think, uh, would be really valuable. And then um, even in terms of your timelines for um, when council meets and uh, your meeting schedule, like, like this has an impact on all of that. So um, it is it does involve kind of a thorough review of your internal timelines and um, approval processes. But what we've what we've certainly found is that some educational booklets, guides, um, implementation plans, um, staff workshops kind of all help with assisting with this change management component that goes along with it. And then ultimately, you will need to monitor success. Um, and while there is no um, uh, proponent-driven um, amendments within five years of a bylaw, um, you have the ability to do a housekeeping amendment. Um, as, as you need to. So there might be little things that, you know, the first bylaw doesn't get it all perfect and you want to make some tweaks as you go. And that's certainly a message that we heard from uh, a number of the municipalities that went forward with the tool. And so if we can just go ahead to the last uh, slide, concluding remarks. Um, the CPPS, uh, a number of municipalities are facing a range of complex interrelated issues and need a broader range of tools to manage those. And um, it's essential that we obtain community, uh, we, we secure the community needs as early on in the process as possible, and that we have complete community elements that support not just the existing community, but those for future generations. And so um, we think that this tool, it is not at all a silver bullet, and there's many challenges in implementing it. Um, and you're seeing as each municipality goes through it, they learn a little bit more, they test out different elements, they try something new. Um, and so with any change management exercise, um, there is some learning um, as you go. But I think as it relates to the challenges that municipalities face, um, this tool offers a, a lot that makes it really beneficial. Um, so with that, I will uh, throw up the last slide with my contact information and I'm happy to uh, try to answer any questions that um, uh, council may have of me. 
Ms. Giancola, my goodness, your introduction certainly provided an accurate description of your knowledge and expertise. We have a number of councillors with questions. Madam Chair, do we have a, Madam Clerk, do you have a registered delegation for this item? Yes, we do. We have Pierre Savageau. All right. While our council colleagues raise their hands, I'd like to move forward with, uh, with our delegation. He may have something that we'd like to follow up with. Pierre? Yes, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just want to say that the uh, presentation is quite a lot, and so I'm digesting that information. So I don't have anything specific as of yet, except for maybe just one thing in regards to um, whether or not the town will proceed as area-specific or town-wide. I can see uh, area-specific Specific, pardon me, specifically dealing with uh, uh, the uh, by the Trafalgar uh, uptown or downtown or <laughs> that area right by Cross. Uh, that's the only thing I wondered. What direction do you think is uh, feasible and doable for the town? Uh, specific or town wide? That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that will come up when we. Uh, have some questions for staff. Councillor Liz Chinna, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Ancola. You're right, there was a lot of uh, info there. The first thing that surprised me was um, since 2007, four smaller municipalities and just um, a street and then Burlington next door starting that in 17 years. So that makes me think there was some problem with it. So I'm not sure if there is or not, but uh, that was uh, my initial thought of not, not very popular and is this becoming a fad that now, you know, one, one municipality sort of in the bigger realm and the next one, next one. So just, just a comment. But my, um, as a result of that, this question may be unfair because it is such a small sample size, but do you have any examples because you mentioned it it's, it's also appealable i i thought initially the ccp uh, was not so i was uh i was wrong on that but it is appealable so in those examples of uh in effect the municipalities have any of them gone through an appeal and what was the result of that because i i noticed when you mentioned best practices was that because of a previous litigation that something was learned so do you have any information about um even though, as I said, it's a very small sample size of, of municipalities. Thank you. Through you, the chair. Um, thank you very much for those excellent questions. Um, as it relates to uh, the 17 years and how few municipalities have picked this up, I think um, it's a, a astute question. And um, there haven't been uh, fundamental changes to the tool itself. Um, I think there's been fundamental changes to other tools um, that are impacting municipalities' interest in this tool. Um, and I think that the, com the complex issues that municipalities are facing continue to get more challenging. And so municipalities are looking at different tools. Um, so I think I can't really, um, I could spend a lot of time surmising about each municipality and what went wrong. Um, there, you know, um, the city of Toronto for a while did try to to do a, uh, I think it was development permit system at the time, went all the way through the divisional court. Um, you can spend some time reading about uh, about that. That was just on the enabling policies. So it wasn't even a bylaw itself. Um, so there has been a history for municipalities in, in um, trying to explore this tool. Um, as it relates to um, the appealability, so it's the bylaws, the community planning permit bylaws, sorry, also the official plan amendment with enabling policies and the community planning permit bylaw um, are appealable. Once it's in force and effect, um, an application, um, there's no third party appeals on an application. So that means only the proponent has the ability to appeal the municipality's decision on that application. As it relates to the bylaw itself, in your question, um, we did work with the town of Huntsville, which is the most recent um, town-wide, the most recent 
um, community planning permit bylaw that is in force and effect. Um, in their case, we understand that they did have three or four um, appeals when they first um, put forward, got the council adoption, um, and they were um, site-specific, negotiated, and um, uh, I, I can't speak to the details of them, but it's now, it's been in force and effect since January of last year, 2023. That answers your question, Councillor. Councillor Elder. Uh, thank you very much, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I guess I'm wondering, and I'd like to know if the community planning permit system was in place in Carlton Place in uh, 2022 when Club Link uh, requested and went to the OMB to build 1,502 dwelling units on the on the golf course. Was that it? Was the community planning system in place then? And that, and also, how well did it work? So through you, the chair, um, my understanding is that Carlton Place has had a community planning permit system since uh, 2008 um, that it's been in force and effect um, and that they've had a number of uh, housekeeping amendments and modifications since then. Um, according to their website in 2020, they started a more comprehensive review um, and I haven't spoke to uh, staff about the specific example that you brought up. So unfortunately, I don't have any context on it on that specific file. But CPPS was in place, in Carlton Place then in 2022, obviously? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, you, the chair. I, I do believe they got smoked with Mark Flowers being the lawyer. Um, what are the shortcomings uh, of the community planning system that you're aware of? Like you said, it's across Canada and we're kind of late uh, commerce to it in the first place, but. Are there any shortcomings at all that you've heard of from municipalities across Canada? Through you, the chair. Um, so in terms of across Canada, each province deal has different legislation. So the Planning Act is only for Ontario. And so municipalities across in other provinces use something called a development permit system. And it has some similarities to what's available in Ontario, um, but it's not exactly the same. Um, but we have been able to, to learn a little bit about um, some of the parameters of what works well and what doesn't um, through, through those other examples. Um, in terms of some of the shortcomings, you know, the tool, um, you are committing yourself to a 45-day decision. Um, no one has brought that up yet, and I didn't see crazy uh, reactions on everyone's face when, when I mentioned that. That is a very short timeline. And so fundamentally, the objective here is, you know, set the parameters of the rules of development of what this the community um, sees as as reasonable parameters and then if you stick within those reasonable parameters 45 days again with the ability to deal with conditions um, for uh, matters that might need to be um, addressed that way um, could be reasonable if a, a development application comes in and is fundamentally outside of anything that that you wanted to accept, then they're not on a 45 day timeline. They're outside of that, it's an, an amendment to the bylaw itself. Um, so one core element is around, you know, the timelines and the fact that this will like fundamentally change the way um, your internal and external, um, you know, application processes um, would be managed. Um, that, that change management involves learning. And, and again, it involves you know, you're not going to get it perfect the right time, the first time, sorry. So there will be modifications, I would say. Um, your zoning bylaw um, is not is not perfect. Um, and so this also won't be perfect the first time. But it does give you more ability to identify um, some parameters of flexibility in regulation that zoning fundamentally does not provide. Um, so I don't know if that totally answers your question. Happy to, to explore other elements. But... Um, it it uh, absolutely has its challenges to work through um, and is not uh, is not the answer to all problems in Ontario. So in our official plan in 2009, we brought in where we said an area, say an example, with tw a maximum of 20 stories. But of course, we allow bonusing. Um, it, now, if somebody appeals and now bonusing is gone, how, how, how can, what would CPPS do for us now if the application is already in that they're trying to do something? 
Um, can I just clarify the question? So it um, is a question if there's already an active application by the time you put a bylaw in? Yes. There's a question about if, how if, bonus if we, gets if a, Yeah, you're exactly, you hit it right on. If there is already an application in. So typically um, there is transition policies in the bylaw itself. Um, and like anything that has a site plan agreement um, would get picked up directly. Um, anything with holding provisions, a municipality typically picks that up. Um, and something that is like in pre-con phase um, may potentially need to go through the, pro the new process. So um, there is transition policies that you would want to establish in your bylaw indicating how any existing or ongoing development application would be picked up directly. Okay, yeah. Well, I've got a, I do have a lot of questions, but the others are asking questions. But I appreciate your knowledge on this, and uh, I look forward to learning a lot more. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Mara. Uh, thank you very much for the information. Um, my question has to do with the implementing OPA that brings it forward, and I, I know the um, I, I know the province changed the rules lately, whereby um, uh, developers cannot apply our OPAs on a whole now, but um, would they be able to, or would a group or private property owners be able to um, to appeal the implementing um, um, CPPS bylaw that would come through an OPA if they say they didn't like the path we were going on and wanted to reserve their rights to build a thirty-story condo and not have to be locked in with us? You know, how what what sort of legal um, legal pathways do individual property owners have at the onset of bringing this 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 um, this permitting system in? Through you, the chair. Um, thank you for that excellent question. Um, and uh, first comment would be to, to double check anything that I say with your internal um, legal group. Um, but in terms of my understanding, so uh, where a um, official plan amendment is. Uh, with the enabling policies would be um, for a major, a protected major transit station area. There may be some elements of the official plan amendment that may be protected under the Planning Act under that protected MTSA component. So that's the boundary and some uh, parameters around overall um, minimum, maximum um, density. Um, as it relates to the enabling policies for a community planning permit by law, um, those would not be protected. Uh, is my understanding, unless the minister ordered a community planning permit system for a municipality, in which case um, I believe that the bylaw and the OPA policies may not be appealable. Um, but again, I haven't seen that happen across the province, and we definitely, I, I'm not a lawyer, um, so you should uh, definitely talk to a lawyer about that. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'm just, I guess it goes to, you know, obviously, is this something that's worked better with smaller groups of private property owners? Or if you have areas that have large numbers of individual property owners, it would be much more difficult to get alignment with the enabling bylaw. I'm, I'm just sort of trying to figure out, I mean, we, we had a zoning bylaw in North Oakville appealed, I think, for decades in, it, in our entire town because somebody didn't like what was going on and it just ties everything up in knots. So I'm one. I'm wondering if we have the authority to just sort of push through with this or whether we could foresee something like that happening again. I think through you, Chair, the, the only thing I would just highlight is the importance of those kind of stakeholder conversations um, to try to set reasonable um, kind of rules of development. So um, I think that that is, the, the, unless the minister orders a community planning permit, um, system. My understanding is the bylaw itself would be appealable, um, and so it is important that you have kind of thorough um, engagement and try to um, establish some reasonable uh, parameters there that um, avoids a lengthy appeal process. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. We happen to have a few lawyers with us this evening. Uh, just looking over, is that something that you can provide an answer on, or is it something that you'd like to research and provide back to us? Mr. Chair, uh, we'd certainly be happy to uh, uh, look further into this uh, very important uh, topic in terms of CPP and, and report back. Thank you very much. 
answer your question, Councillor? Councillor Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Lischen and Councillor Miro answered my, or uh, that's the main question I had with respect to the appealability of, of um, decisions or, or applications under this. I have a couple more minor questions. One is uh, with respect to what I heard during the presentation. I heard six months or six years for implementation. Is that, were my ears deceiving me or is that uh, what the estimated time frame is to actually go from script to screen on this? Through you, the chair, um, I think the six-year reference was the area-specific plans for um, Burlington um, in developing those plans. And so um, that was a multi-year process. Um, and there were, it started, they were in mobility hubs. Um, and there was planning around mobility hubs. And then there was a few legislative changes. And it was made for transit station areas. And they were redefined. And the boundaries were adjusted. And the density targets were changed. Um, so uh, that was not a linear process by any um, by any means. Um, but the in terms of preparing a, a bylaw, um, I think the critical thing is um, uh, being ready to establish what are the rules of development um, that you have for a certain geography. And so um, if you are looking at applying this for an area that you've gone through a comprehensive planning process and have um, established, a, a plan for that area, you know, um, whether that is Midtown or somewhere else, um, then preparing a bylaw to regulate that can be, you know, in, in the case of Huntsville, I think it was a, a total of two years um, from, you know, initial um, preparation, uh, like hiring the consultant through um, adoption of the plan. It might even might have even been a year and a half. I can't totally remember. Um, I had I had at least one child between now and then, so um, uh, memory is a little fuzzy. But um, certainly, it doesn't need to be a six-year process. I don't I don't think it's um, the development of the plan up front, though. Like what it, what takes a long time is a municipality deciding, you know, what are the heights that we want in a certain geography? You know, what is the density? What is the built form? What do we care about in this area? Once you've established that. We can write a bylaw to regulate those things fairly quickly as the establishment of those the vision principles and and um, all those parameters that can take some time. Yeah, I could see that opening up the bylaw would create quite the length of conversation around those 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 pieces because there's a, a, about as there's about as many opinions as there are the population of Oakville. So that'd be a tough process for sure. In terms of the bylaw itself, that it has to be rewritten. Is it is are we effectively throwing out the existing building bylaw or is it is it does it inform the new bylaw? How does that process work? Because I, I, I know how complex it is to, to, uh, to address a, a, a building bylaw. We've, in, in my time here, we've reviewed it a couple times, and that by, that by itself is a lengthy process. What, what's involved in that? Yeah, so um, to implement, a, through you, the chair, to implement a community planning permit bylaw um, for a specific geography, you would repeal the zoning bylaw for said geography. Um, I understand that uh, the town of Oakville zoning bylaw um, uh, has you know is fairly up to date in certain areas. Um, I'm I'm not uh, I haven't used it um, a lot, so I'm not super familiar with it. Um, but uh, it would repeal the zoning bylaw um, and uh, instead have a community planning permit bylaw for that geography, whether it's municipal wide or specific um, area specific um, context. But it's it's a bylaw that has to be written from scratch, I assume, right? You're not you're not adapting the existing. And I sorry, I said building bylaw, I meant zoning bylaw. You're not having to. Are you adapting the existing zoning bylaw, or are you writing it from scratch? So, in the case of um, Huntsville, where they did a commu uh, municipality wide um, community planning permit system, um, it was very much taking the parameters from the official plan and from the existing zoning bylaw and putting them into the new framework for a, a CPP bylaw. So, um, you know, the uh, typically when you were, if you're doing that on a municipal wide basis, like you are picking up, you know, what's working well in your zoning bylaw, you don't, you don't need to redo that. You're just picking that part up and then you're, you're adding parameters as it relates to like thresholds for approvals, that sort of thing, um, where there's like area specific community planning permit systems and they're taking, they're doing a big jump in terms of the, the um, we sometimes refer to pre-zoning 
It's not like a term that is actually in any kind of legislation, but the concept is like, it does your zoning just control what is there currently on the ground or is your zoning allowing the future use that your official plan sees on that property in the future? And so um, municipalities that are trying to pre-zone an area through this tool, you know, establishing that pre-zoning comes from your official plan policies. And so you would be um, either updating your zoning bylaw for that geography based on the official plan, or you're using a community planning permit bylaw instead. But either way, if you've gone through an exercise to update your official plan policies, um, there's the practice of just leaving it to the developer to come in through incremental zoning bylaw amendments, I think is not the best tool to um, set a municipality up for success. So you are at a position where you will have to update your zoning bylaw and it's for that geography if you're hoping to accommodate the uses in your official plan. Well, amen to that last comment for sure. The um, with respect, and this maybe this is too broad a question. If it is, and then I'll I'll stand it down and maybe ask it later on. But uh, could looking at a, a a planning process, say for example, Midtown Core, how would how would this process change? How would how would this the community planning uh, program change that process? Um, so through you, Chair, I'm not um, extremely familiar with uh, Midtown and the planning process that's been undertaken to date. Um, I think that uh, it is important to establish the overall um, land use and objectives for an area before you go and write um, the, the regulations for that area. So um, I understand in talking to staff that you are um, that that you've had a staff report come recently and there's another meeting later on in the month um, about uh, Midtown. So um, I, I, would re I would think that uh, as it relates to land use regulation tool, um, it would follow the official plan policies. Um, where you might want to have some overlap is just that there are um, there is a need in your official plan to have enabling policies for the community planning permit system. Um, typically, there's a there's some things you can set up without writing the bylaw, and then there's some parts that you kind of need to do at the same time as writing the bylaw because it establishes like what are the classes of development, and um, and you don't know until you are going through the bylaw preparation process. Um, so I think uh, certainly trying to have those enabling policies in your in your official plan amendment um, makes sense, and then. Um, I think picking up on kind of that community engagement and the momentum that you have around Midtown um, to help establish a framework that um, ultimately, I think one of the biggest challenges that municipalities face is when they complete a big comprehensive engagement exercise and they bring community members involved and they get all this input and then the plan's done and then someone proposes something fundamentally outside of that mm -hmm. and it goes to the Ontario Land Tribunal and they make whatever decision they make, that can really lose trust in the process and all that involvement. And so I think um, the timing if you choose to go down this path would be immediately following our official plan amendment um, for Midtown to try to get those plans into force and effect through the legislation itself in, in regulatory form. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Noel. Councillor Adams. Thanks very much. Um, uh, first of all, I, um, uh, one of the other councillors uh, mentioned club linking, and, and uh, I think that was a location in Ottawa, not Carleton Place. Uh, but if I'm wrong, I apologize. Um, just in terms of, um, I, I don't think that there was a CPVS in place in that location. Um, can I ask you about the appeal points a little bit more? I know a bunch of my colleagues have asked you about this, but uh, if you, if if the community wanted to uh, create an, an area where it was 20 stories and I don't know, 100 units per hectare or something, but there were landowners who wanted 30 stories and 200 units per hectare, um, what are the appeal points for that? Is it, you have to have an official plan in place first before you create the CPPSs, I think what you were just saying. And so you would have an appeal process where a landowner might disagree with the, uh, 
the municipalities and the community's view or vision for a particular area. And so you'd have to fight through an OLT hearing through that process first. And then once that was dealt with, you would then try to create the, the CPPS box that would house the zoning that would go with that, um, you know, whether it was 20 stories or 30 stories and, or whatever in between. Um, and there's an appeal process for going through the CPPS or creating the CPPS box. Um, so that's another appeal point. Once you're through that, you're good for five years. And after five years, you can be back to appeal process. Is that correct? And you can also have appeals to the zoning or the CPPS zoning um, during the five-year process. So there's basically a constant appeal process that's available. Um, through the chair, uh, I will attempt to provide um, uh, a little bit of context there. But again, I think your um, internal legal counsel will provide more advice as it relates to um, appealability of specific elements. Um, the um, it, some of the challenges uh, that you just outlined um, might be similar to what Burlington has faced with their new official plan being under appeal and um, provincial direction to implement one's major transit station areas. Um, the the uh, region. Um, you know, has had their process and the province's process for approval. Um, and so it, uh, there, there are these like very, it's very difficult for municipalities to bring anything forward when you have all of these different pieces that are being appealed at the same time. Um, the, so I'll just leave that point there. Um, as it relates to your question about the five years. So once a community planning permit bylaw is in force and effect, um, for the first five years, a proponent can cannot um, put in a development application that is requires a bylaw amendment unless council provides a resolution to do so. So that's that st policy stability for five years um, is um, is related to like a specific application um, unless council wants to see it. There's no process for them to put forward a bylaw amendment within the first five years. Following five years, they can put forward a bylaw amendment um, and you can look at it and review it and determine whether you want to accept it or not. Um, so that's the policy stability piece about the um, bylaw itself. Um, and then as it relates to um, the like likelihood of appealing the community planning permit bylaw. I think that's perhaps a question that, and, and timing of that um, would be better suited for your internal legal counsel. How do changes in the requirements for official plans um, get treated? So if the province, so if we were working under the current provincial planning system and we managed to get an OP that met all the tests and we created a CPPS and then the province said, Oh, by the way, um, all sites within 800 meters of a, a train station should allow for something different. Um, does it throw the CPPS stuff out the window and all of a sudden you're back to square one and you have to re-review your OP and recreate the CPPS? Um, so I think that uh, I would struggle to kind of guess at the various different tools the province may or may not use and how exactly they would make those sort of adjustments. But this is a land use regula regulation tool. And so similar to any of the previous adjustments that the province has made, it doesn't automatically change your zoning bylaw. There's no, as far as I understand, no, but like, so unless the minister is going to do a minister zoning bylaw um, for the area or, or, um, you know, take that kind of heavy tool. Like if you think about all the other changes that you've seen over the last number of years, they have all been um, a requirement to implement them. They don't automatically modify one zoning bylaw. And so I imagine it would be some similar process. Um, but again, it, it's very difficult for me to say without any specific parameters. And, and so maybe um, it's a, this a, is a guessing. legal question for our team here, um, but maybe it's also a uh, you get to the end of the five-year point and all of a sudden you have to quickly re-change your OP and change your zoning uh, 
uh, to go with it, perhaps. Uh, but that's a great question for our legal team, I think. Um, the last question is a one about the discretionary piece, which uh, created some questions in our community around uh, the sort of the more minor variances and things like setbacks, things like heights of a house. You know, if if it, if this was a community-wide uh, planning system. Uh, and somebody wanted it to build a single detached home that was 15 meters instead of 12 meters based on some discretion. How does that process work and who determines what that discretion is and how likely would that discretionary part of the, the bylaw be to be appealed? What's been the history in other locations? Um, through you, Chair. Um, if, if, if I can, I can just, just add one point about the, la the last point you made before, um, one best practice in terms of um, trying to make sure your official plan policies can withstand the test of time is to keep them at the policy level and avoid them getting into a regulatory environment and then to use it with your land use regulation tool. Um, so I just mentioned that as it relates to kind of, um, you know, those are their forward looking documents and they should be appropriately flexible to the range of futures that we have. That doesn't mean that that they don't get revisited, but just um, the one point I would make that they're not they're not the same in terms of um, you know the the policies enable and the bylaw the zoning bylaw restricts. Um, so if you think about them hand in hand that way, um, as it relates to uh, your second question around um, uh, heights uh, potential height variations, um, so uh, a bylaw can a you can set up the bylaw however you want. Generally, there's like tons of flexibility in how you establish it. Um, but what you just described in terms of other municipal practices, um, you might have a, uh, a variation that is defined that is considered kind of a minor variation. And that threshold for that minor variation is established in the bylaw itself. Um, so if, if your example was within that threshold, then a proponent would have to provide rationale as to how they met Again, the criteria that you've established through your bylaw for what um, makes that an acceptable variation, and also any conditions that are noted there. Can you? So, say, for example, could, could one say there will be no discretion? It's going to be twelve meters, and that's it. Um, absolutely, you could say that, and the bylaw may or may not be appealed. Um, but absolutely, you could put whatever you could put that in the bylaw for sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you, uh, through you, Chair uh, Giddings. Um, thank you very much for coming out and withstanding all of this barrage of questions. Um, I just before I get to all of mine, can you just confirm for me um, the province actually recommends community permit planning? Does it not in uh, uh, in the Act or in one of the the governing documents? Um, thank you, and not at all a barrage. I enjoy this uh, a lot, and um, I'm happy to be here all night. This is uh, one of a little hobby horse topic of mine, so I'm happy to, to chat about it any time. Um, in terms of uh, uh, provincial direction, um, there were modifications um, when the province introduced Bill 108 that allowed the minister to establish a community planning permit system. Um, and I believe those are tied to major transit station areas, um, but I'll just need to double check in the legislation. Um, so they have signaled for some time that this is a tool um, that they want municipalities to use um, and that there's, uh, you know, um, that if municipalities don't use it, the minister can choose to order one in certain geographies. Um, does that answer your question, Councillor? Yes, it does. Um, and if we are, in fact, if we used Midtown as an example, if it's a PMTSA, it has protection around appeals. How does that complement or uh, uh, affect a, a CPP? Um, through you, Chair. Um, so my understanding is that the, the protected major transit station area um, would protect the definition of the boundary that is not appealable and the minimum maximum height parameters of your official plan. And so, um, again, this is where I think um, some internal legal advice would be helpful in terms of making sure um, that the my my interpretation of kind of where you're at the process um, is accurate. Um, but if you have an official plan 
amendment that set that is under the protected major transit station area and the parameters that are required and protected by the planning act um, and you implement a community planning permit by law through that um, i i don't think there's anything that stops um, an appeal to the bylaw itself um, if there's parameters that go outside but i think the parameters that are um, within the protected mtsa um, would be not appealable. Um, and that would, that's, again, my interpretation um, of the Planning Act, but uh, it definitely would benefit from your legal advice. And this hasn't been tested. So, um, yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, have you had an opportunity to look at the draft OPA for Midtown as an example because of the earlier questions around the enabling of CPP in our OPA? Have you had an opportunity to look at it? Um, I've taken a very quick skim, um, but not in any kind of depth. Okay. Because uh, it, it sounds to me like we should take advantage of the fact that y you've got this experience to look at that draft OPA and make sure that the enabling language is to our best advantage should council decide that they want uh, CPP to be in it, it's just as a, an aside. Um, I want to sort of get clarity on CPP and the OPA. So we talk about a, a height schedule um, and setting minimums and maximums, but CPP also sets a schedule. So are you bound in a CPP by what's in the OPA or can you set different heights uh, in a CPP? So um, it, the threshold that requires an official plan amendment um, should be broader than the threshold that requires. Like if you think about think about this as a zoning tool, zoning like tool. If you um, require an official plan amendment, you should also always require a zoning bylaw amendment. But you can have an application that comes in that only requires a zoning bylaw amendment, but does not require an official plan amendment. And so if you think about it, the um, the official plan policies um, should be broad enough that they provide um, a, a broader range of um, instances where um, you can meet those futures and you can accommodate those policies without requiring an amendment. The bylaw, the community planning permit bylaw works within that framework, but you could say, for example, um, if the official plan allowed up to 25 stories on this property um, under the community planning permit system, if you're between one and 12 stories, these are the rules for you. If you're being between 12 and 15, these are the rules for you. And if you're in between 15 and 25, these are the rules for you. So there, you're working within the framework that you're, the community planning permit system, um, bylaw implements the official plan. Um, it cannot provide something outside of the official plan, um, but it can certainly add a lot more stringent and parameters within it. So if I, if, so if our intent is to get the best possible community and complete community, um, uh, and uh, we set minimum and maximum heights, are we, is what you're describing that we would have to take height above the maximum that's in the OPA to potentially get some of those other benefits you mentioned some of the other communities have been getting? Or can we have a base height that allows us to get those additional uh, important elements that complete a community, which end up resulting in somebody getting some height. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for that question through the chair. Um, so the parameters for facilities heights, uh, for facility services and matters is an exchange for height and density, um, but it says within the parameters of the bylaw or outside. So there's nothing, so um, there is an opportunity um, for many of the communities that have enforced and effect bylaws, um, they have a maximum height threshold for council. Um, and uh, let's say, let's say in that negotiation, um, like class three negotiation um, application that comes in, it still, it has a maximum height um, that council can accept up to, um, and it has facility services and matters associated with it. Um, what you're seeing in the Burlington example is um, where there is um, uh, a variation 
um, a desire to provide guidance around facility services and matters to go up to even the class two variation height threshold. Um, so not, not um, just having an open-ended list for council to work with, but also providing a clear path for the development industry as to how to get to the class two height thresholds. Um, so I think to answer your question, you there is an ability through the legislation to um, identify facility services and matters. It is intended to be in exchange for height and density, um, but there's nothing to say that it has to be over a certain point of height and density that is established through the bylaw itself. So just so I make sure I got this straight, if I'm, uh, if the, uh, if the maximum is 40 stories, and um, uh, and it, it, in the OPA as an example, um, and there's a whole bunch of other elements uh, that we may want in exchange for that 40 stories. In the CPP, are you explaining that we could say from this height to this uh, to one height to a higher height? these are the elements that you would need to provide in order to attain uh, that height. Um, that is what uh, Burlington is, is trying to do at the moment, yes. Um, and I think that um, there is the opportunity through the legislation to provide that. Okay. And I think the, the one thing to just be cautious about is, I guess, timing up. Um, and this, there's maybe a an internal strategy conversation just about um, if the OPA um, does provide that maximum height, um, and then you're adding more parameters after um, just any any potential conflict um, reaction, negative reaction that they may have. Um, so there might be an internal strategy conversation just about timing of all of these different pieces. So it sounds to me like we need to get the OPA heights right, is what you're telling me. But I won't put words in your mouth. Um, so th thank you for explaining that. I want to just clarify, the additional parkland that you mentioned could be part of those facilities benefits um, description. Um, is that above the parkland dedication bylaw? I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. That we could get additional parkland, not just the parkland dedication bylaw, um, uh, requirement through this process if it was approved? So Huntsville, as part of their uh, negotiated Class 3 um, by, uh, development application, um, has a list of a variety of different things that a municipality may, community benefits, and municipality um, may um, take in exchange for uh, additional height and density, and parkland above the um, Planning Act, um, se Section 42 Planning Act parkland requirement is listed um, as one of those items, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, sort of my last clarifying question is, when you were talking about um, uh, sustainability, are, are, so those elements that you saw being part of the community permit planning or the conditions that could be put on it, are those, do they have to line up with the conditions that you would put in an OPA? So maybe my question's not clear. So the OPA has some limited language currently on sustainability. Um, uh, if, if you want uh, to optimize um, or put in conditions related to sustainability um, in the CPP, does it have to be in the OPA or um, can the CPP have that level of detail and clarity, um, and which is the preferred? In both, in which one takes primacy? So typically, a community planning permit by law implements the policies of the official plan. Um, it can add definition, clarity, and parameters, additional uh, parameters at that level. Um, but I think if you had it just in the bylaw without any like policy reference, it might be difficult to defend um, through a CPP bylaw process um, because this is a land use regulation tool that is intended to implement the official plan policies. Um, so I do think um, that the CPP bylaw should take direction from the, the official plan 
um, and as it relates to sustainability matters as well. Um, so that's not to say that the official plan needs to specify what level of low impact development will be acceptable, but the importance of low impact development to the town of Oakville should be established in your policies in the official plan. Thank you very much for answering all these questions. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McNeese. Thank you, uh, for you, Acting Mayor Giddings. Uh, and thank you, Justine, for the very detailed and thorough presentation. I certainly learned something new every time. Uh, just a couple of questions. Just wanted to follow up on the Parkland question. Um, my understanding is Burlington has set a specific goal for their protected MTSAs uh, in uh, uh, in addition to the Section 42 requirements for Parkland. Is it they're trying to get three times what is required? Is that correct? Um, so through you, Chair, um, the uh, City of Burlington um, undertook a park provisioning master plan to identify parking needs for the municipality um, as a whole and um, has recognized that um, the Planning Act changes to parkland dedication do limit its, uh, the municipality's ability to um, obtain the parking parkland needs of the community long term um, in the draft official plan at uh, draft community planning permit bylaw from October 2023. Um, they did include uh, a requirement for additional parkland dedication above the section 42 parkland requirements. Um, they have received a fair bit of feedback on that and are working through stakeholder uh, feedback at the moment. Um, but certainly the, the draft does include that, yes, um, Councillor. Okay, thank you. And I, I can certainly understand and appreciate from my council colleagues, we're always um, concerned about appeals. Um, you know, I think at one point the joke was that the OMB was the Oakville Municipal Board, but uh, it's now certainly evolved to many other places. Now, is the sort of idea or thinking behind CPPS or in the states that's, you know, referred to more form-based codes in cities like Denver and Chicago use them. It's it's quite commonplace, but is the idea not to provide more clarity, certainty, and predictability up front and that you would hope that because of that and the streamlined process and the accelerated uh, approval process that there would be less fuzziness to avoid appeals? Um, through you, the chair, I think the the fundamental concept of the tool is to establish clear rules and expectations up front. And if you fit with, if you can work within those rules, then um, you know, 45 days to approval or a shorter timeline is reasonable. Um, so I think certainly the the um, the the idea around the tool and, and the um, thinking around it was um, if municipalities can be clear on what they require to get to yes, then that um, is beneficial and um, we can make uh, improvements to the approval process accordingly. Um, I think that the, um, the, the bylaw itself uh, does take different look and feel depending on each municipality. Some have gone more with something that might resemble a form-based code and others um, you know, it, it doesn't look anything like that. So I think that depends more on the municipality and, and what they're hoping to achieve with the tool um, and what is most important to their community um, that they're trying to uh, to focus on. Um, so I think that there's certain elements, you know, of some of them of some of the examples that do do look a little bit like that, um, but not all of them, I would say. Okay, so just to sort of sum it up, I mean, fundamentally, the community gets a lot more say up front. They um, are provided with um, maybe more tools or more certainty that they could get X, Y, Z, the facilities, uh, services, and matters that, that matter to them. You know, in Burlington's case, affordable housing, uh, connectivity, complete communities fund, sort of things like that that are, that are tangible. Um, and then town staff has a streamlined process, and then the benefit for the development community is that clarity, certainty, so that they can hit the market they want if they want to play within, you know, essentially what the community has pre-approved for an area. Is that a fair assessment, or? I think that's uh, through you, Chair. I think that's fair. I think that um, 
you know, one of the biggest challenges to, um, like to making a development pro forma work is the uncertainty in, um, you know, when it's uh, not as of right. And so there's a lot of risk that goes along with that development approvals process. Um, you know, if, if there is, um, you know, whether it is minor variance or minor zoning bylaw amendment or in cases where a zoning bylaw is not up to speed with official plan, um, we're asking a development proponent to um, go through the process just to meet the requirements of the official plan itself. And often with that uncertainty, you know, there needs to be some reward as part of going through all of that um, process. So it actually pushes, I believe it, it even pushes um, uh, land values and even further when you do have um, the, the speculation that occurs when you're having to upfront all of that um, risk early on as a development proponent. And so I do think that, um, you know, some of the value of this tool um, is, you know, setting clear expectations up front and um, assuming that you provided sufficient flexibility within the tool and you're not pushing everything to require a bylaw amendment, because um, then that would not have satisfied the objectives of the tool at first. Um, I think, um, Councillor McNeese, you've uh, summarized it quite well. Okay, and just two more questions. You bring up a good point about land value, and um, uh, I'm sure you saw the 100-page white paper that Sabelle put together for us that was uh, very informative. And something I took away from that um, was that it, it helps temper speculation. So it, it helps, you know, I, I, I find now we get holdouts and, you know, it, it's anyone's guess what a, you know, it's it's sort of the, the I hate to say the last sucker in that, you know, pays an exorbitant amount for a piece of land. Now they're committed. Now they have no choice but to seek a, you know, official plan amendment, bylaw amendment to, to get as much as they can. And they assume that there, there will be an appeal. Um, can you talk a little bit or briefly about, you know, how this can help temper speculation on, on commercial land value so that we don't, can, you know, uh, consistently face this battle of, you know, people have overpaid for land and now they have to do everything they can to squeeze every penny out of it. And we can, you know, I think the idea of CPPS, it, it's sort of more of a collaborative approach to get what the community needs and help temper speculation. Through you, the chair, I think one of the um, one of the key opportunities is to establish the expectations and then be able to kind of withhold those. And so, um, you know, similar to you know it, the dramatic impact of when you buy land, there's also like when did you start your development? Did you get were you held to having like did you have to put the commercial uses in or was were you the fourth one in that had to provide commercial enough for the entire area like there what about the parks when did that happen the timing of it so there's um i think the objective is to provide a more clear transparent process that outlines the um, overall community vision for an area um and then reduces some of that certainly speculation and the negative impact that is happening depending on when you are participating in the process um, to have that be a little bit more fair. Okay, just one final question. Thank you for that. Um, so to do with provincial planning policy, we've had, as you know, eight or sorry, four housing bills uh, in this term of council and potentially another three on the way before the end of the term. Um, I know bill 108 um, provided actually a little more clarity that the minister could impose CPPS on municipalities in certain geographical areas like MTSAs. Um, and almost every planning tool, I think, has been changed um, in the previous four housing bills. But my understanding is that CPPS has not been changed. Is that uh, fair to say? Yeah, uh, through you, Chair, outside of um, like Bill 108 that allowed the minis uh, minister to order one, um, the the legislative changes, um, if you look at many of them, whether it is, you know, the re re reduction of third party appeals on minor variances, the need to delegate um, site plan control to staff, um, the opportunity to delegate minor zoning bylaws to staff. Um, I think what you may be seeing is 
um, kind of a, a, I'll say gentle push. Um, you can decide whether you think it's gentle or not um, towards municipalities um, align their land use regulation tools with their official plans, establishing a framework for growth um, and having um, uh, slightly less conflict so late in the process as it relates to um, individual site by site development. Um, and so I certainly think that there's um, many opportunities that a community planning permit system can provide um, that seem to be in line with the, the various different um, legislative changes that have been happening. Um, but I will not try to put any uh, words in um, any uh, members of uh, uh, our ministry staff's mouth. So um, that's just my own perspective. So to, to sum it up, it's, it, it's, it's survived all of the legislative changes, uh, the last four bills. And, uh, you know, who knows about the next three bills, but um, it seems like it's gotten a bit stronger. Okay, that's it for me. And thanks again very much, uh, Justine, for your depth of knowledge on this topic. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elgar, you have another question for us. Uh, thank you. A uh, question and clarification also. Uh, I was When you mentioned that Carlton Place had uh, had, had CPPS for a number of years, I, it made, I, I, in my, my mind, I was thinking it was the golf course that was in Carlton Place. The golf course I was referring to was in fact in Canada, not in, not in Carlton Place, and under Canada is under the umbrella of Ottawa, and they don't have CPPS. But I do have one further question. How do you establish base height? Um, through you, the chair, um, I do understand the city of Ottawa is looking at preparing a community planning permit system for Canada North at the moment and has released a directions report as part of that. So um, who knows uh, how that tool might shape um, their future development uh, approvals. Um, uh, in terms of base height, I, I'm not um, uh, I'm not sure what you what exactly what you mean, Councillor. Well, I thought I heard you mention base height when you were speaking to us, and I'm thinking about say there's a superficial place called Midtown, and to get a base height before we start going up higher, how would we calculate that, or what should how would you go about that? So. Um, I think that the bylaw needs to establish height, maximum height thresholds um, in the bylaw itself um, and uh, associated, um, it, it can have associated criteria conditions requirements that go along with those maximum height thresholds um, as it relates to like what appropriate maximum height threshold is. I think it's very different depending on the geography and the parameters and the density requirements from the province and all these other pieces. So um, I find it difficult to make any comment about uh, a base height for Midtown. Do you have any examples where under our current official plan, where we have 20 stories in a location, and but we all know there used to be a thing called bonusing. Bonusing was taken away. Do you have any examples of where bonusing has more than doubled the height that would be allowed in an official plan in a, in, a, in any municipality in Ontario. Is there anything? Is there any an example out there we could use? Um, through you, Chair, can I clarify the question? So, um, is the so bonusing is not available um, for municipalities anymore um, under a community planning permit system? There's something similar called facility services that matters, but it's not. Like it's not the same. Um, it's not Section Thirty-Seven of the Planning Act. Um, it, is the question whether um, there are places across the province that have had a maximum height that has um, their maximum height has doubled recently? Is that what the question is? Councilor? That is that is exactly my question. When in fact bonusing was still allowed. Um, so uh, I, I would say to you, Chair, um, there's a number. Of, uh, a number of municipalities across the province are dealing with uh, planning for their major transit station areas. And um, there have been instances where um, in planning for major transit station areas, um, some municipalities have removed maximum heights altogether. Um, some have looked at um, adjusting their maximum heights for certain geographies. Um, it is, um, there's a, 
every community is very different and um, uh, many, many municipalities are dealing with major transit stationaries and what they look like and what they feel like and what they're going to control going forward. Um, you'll see in the case of the, again, the draft Burlington community planning permit system at the moment, at the draft from October, um, the council uh, negotiated um, class does not have a maximum height threshold in it um, in that in the draft bylaw that was produced. Um, so uh, that um, was uh, again based on the draft at the moment in time um, and allowed the opportunity for council to have maximum flexibility to accommodate a broad range of um, applications through the bylaw itself. Um, it every municipality is quite different in terms of what they're looking at, but I'm sure there would be examples of places that have um, looked at uh, significant increases to height lately. Um, it's certainly a, a hot topic issue. I thank you for all your knowledge and information. It's a, it's a it's like a moving. It's a, definitely something that's changing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elgar. Uh, Councillor Adams. I hope I'll be quick. Uh, Councillor Elgar uh, made me um, want to ask a, a similar question. How, how much ground financially would a CPPS allow you to regain from all the ground that municipalities have lost by way of changes to the, the um, various community benefit programs that we've got, um, NDCs and everything else, parkland? Um, so through you, Chair, I would say that um, municipalities are trying to um, try, they're trying to use the tools that they have available and, and certainly that this tool shows some hope in terms of trying to uh, fill in some of those gaps. Um, but uh, again, the, um, the bylaw itself is appealable. And so um, I think that there's, what you'll see is you can, uh, the development community is open to, um, you know, if you have specific parameters um, and you outline them and you have um, a variety of kind of options to achieve the objectives, then I think there is um, an opportunity to, to come up with a tool that can satisfy, you know, developer interests and community interests. Um, but I, I suspect that there is a limit to what you can ask for. All right. So it sounds like maybe slim pickings, but maybe there's a little bit of pickings if I read through the, the lines there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Councillor McNeese. One uh, last quick one through you, Chair. Um, something I uh, sort of uh, learned new tonight is just that CPPS actually has a different definition for development. And I, I believe that was the appeal in Huntsville and Innisville and a few areas like that. Could you just maybe help us contextualize it in more of our urban suburban environment on how that might help us this different um, legal definition of development? Um, thank you for that question to you chair. Um, so the definition of development includes site alteration and vegetation removal. Um, so um, if you so choose, you could include, um, I actually don't know if the town of Oakville has a tree preservation bylaw, but I assume you probably do. Yes, no? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so it could include your tree preservation bylaw directly in the um, community planning permit bylaw, um, if you so choose. Um, it could also deal with elements of site alteration. And so um, certainly in the case of like shoreline development, that was really um, desirable as it relates to erosion control and um, you know people having an impact on um, the, trying to preserve the natural shoreline um, as it relates to a more urban environment. Um, you still could uh, try to, um, through the single bylaw, capture more um, range of application types. Um, as it relates to some of the, so everything, every element that is defined as development, which I just referred to as everything under site plan plus site alteration and vegetation removal, requires a permit unless otherwise exempt through the bylaw itself. So you would want to establish in your bylaw what types of development does, do you not want to require a permit? Um, so uh, you could indicate, you know, 
tree removal over a certain size, perhaps similar to what you have in your current tree preservation bylaw um, would be the parameter, or um, you could look at adjusting that um, based on um, other elements that might be important to the specific geography that it's applying to. Okay, so it could essentially help us preserve and enhance our, our canopy. Yes. Okay, thank you. No further questions. My goodness, uh, Ms. Giancola, thanks for, oh, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Hi, uh, Mr. Chair, I was just prepared to move it um, and uh, I just ask one final question of staff, which is, will they be asking uh, uh, Justine to look at the OPA in regards to the enabling CPP? If that could be answered before we, we uh, the final move and vote is, that would be great. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, through you. We will take that back under advisement. We just want to be cautious. If there's extra work to be done going forward, we don't want to preclude Dylan from uh, from participating in that going forward. So I, um, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. We wouldn't want to preclude them as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, while you're standing up, we had a question from the delegation earlier in terms of is this an area specific plan that's being considered or would it be town wide? If you could just give a brief thought to that one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The plan and what council approved at the last P&D was uh, to initiate the work for Midtown specifically. Doesn't necessarily mean that the learnings can't be applied on a broader scale, which is that our hope, uh, but the, the short term over the next two years will be for Midtown. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Ms. Giancola, uh, quite the hobby you have. Um, thank you for your time and experience. You certainly excel at it. Uh, so thanks for spending your evening with us. Thank you for your time. So Councillor Hazlitt Thiel, you've moved receipt of that. All in favor? No opposed, and that is carried. Moving right along. Uh, 7.2, the Parks and Open Space Town of Oakville Parks Plan, formerly known as the Town of Oakville Parks Plan and Parkland Dedication. Looks like we'll have to get that uh, Council would like a recess, I understand. How about we break for 10 minutes? How's that? We'll be back at 840.
Uh, we've had a request to move uh, item 7.3 up in the agenda at the request of staff and as there are no delegations to speak to this matter in accordance with our procedural bylaw, uh, are anyone have any, any councillors have any questions or? Thank you, Councillor Duddick, that is moved. Thank you very much. No, you don't have to vote on it. Okay. Uh, to the chair, you don't have to vote on it. You have the authority under the procedure bylaw to do so. Thank you very much. Now that takes us back to 7.2. Uh, this, <laughs> I'm sorry, 7.3. This was deferred. So back to 7-2. Yes. Uh, the parks and open space, uh, space strategy that was deferred and uh, formerly known as the Parks Plan and Park Plan Dedication Bylaw. Director Charles, you have some information for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to introduce uh, this next item. And from our last discussion at, at P&D last month, we had heard very clearly from Council that further clarity was required uh, around how we prioritize land acquisition, not just, not just within our strategic growth areas, but across town more broadly. We also know that council wanted it to be more explicit in terms of how council identifies where, when, and how we identify that acquisition. And with that in mind, we had had further discussions with our consultant and we've added additional clarity within the parks plan uh, as a result of that. And Mr. Ron Palmer from the planning partnership will take us through those various updates. And the other opportunity that uh, we did see, uh, but this hasn't yet been reflected in the procedure, is to add another level of clarity uh, through adding words into section eight sub, uh, sub one, where we can add in the words uh, within the area of development where possible. Uh, you'll see that on page 30 of the addendum, and we can provide further clarity around that uh, if, if necessary. But just wanted to set that context, um, and, and I, I would also note that the procedure would be going out to, to the public for further consultation later on this year, and uh, Council will see the, the published version of that uh, sooner than later. And so with that, I just wanted to turn over to Mr. Palmer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Palmer. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Gabe. Um, great to be back in Oakville. Um, creeping up to my bedtime, but um, hopefully we can get this uh, get this done uh, for you today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, what we're trying to do tonight, um, as Gabe had uh, indicated, answer some of the questions that uh, Council had last time and talk a little bit about some of the wording refinements clarifications that uh, we have implemented in the, the latest version of the document that of course informs the ongoing, um, first of all, the preparation of the parkland dedication bylaw and then the policy and procedure uh, document that is forthcoming. A uh, couple of questions to begin. Uh, this evening, uh, someone asked last time, does Metrolinks get an exemption from parkland dedication? And the answer is yes, they do. Uh, the second one, interestingly, uh, given this evening, um, how does the community planning permit system deal with parkland dedication? Uh, well, the community planning permit system implements uh, your parkland dedication bylaw in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. Uh, I was here, I did hear some conversation about that. Can you ask for more uh, through your CPPS? Yes, but of course the CPPS is really about um, a negotiated settlement among council and staff uh, the development industry and the public. So if you're going to ask for more parkland, there will be an expectation of something uh, in return, whether that be credit as a community benefit or some other compensation. That would be my expectation. Um, but always 
why wouldn't you ask for more, keeping in mind the other community benefits that you may be uh, looking to achieve, including affordable housing, um, community facilities, and so on. So you still can require the maximum of the Planning Act uh, through the Community Planning Permit System bylaw. Next slide. Um, I took the opportunity to reread chapter four and based on the conversations that we had uh, at the last meeting, I thought it would be an opportunity to prepare a more fulsome introduction and touch on a host of topics uh, that were brought up uh, at the meeting. Um, to begin with a, a goal statement for the document, and I'm not going to read it uh, verbatim, but there are some important principles established in the statement. It talks about continuing to achieve and expand upon your campus of parks, which of course is something that is very important in Oakville and creates, in my mind, part of the image of Oakville as a beautiful town. Um, and to also mention that it is uh, time to start thinking about how your strategic growth areas are going to evolve over time. They have been evolving for 20 years uh, and they are continuing to evolve. Uh, and as they build out and gain importance uh, in the town, we need to make sure we're uh, getting an urban park system within those strategic growth areas. Um, I do talk about the purpose of the Parks Plan 2031, which talks about the parkland target of 2.2 hectares per thousand, which is part of your uh, longer term uh, strategy. Um, it is an aspirational objective that you are currently exceeding. Um, and we think you can continue to achieve that uh, at least to the year 2031. Um, it talks about uh, making sure that we're in conformity with the uh, relevant sections of the Planning Act um, that deal with uh, different levels in the approval process. And of course, responding to uh, provincial legislation as that has been changing uh, four times uh, since we began this project. Um, and we're still waiting for some elements of those legislative changes to be more properly and, and more fulsomely uh, explained through regulation. Um, we do talk about uh, the need for parkland, linking back to your objective of 2.2 uh, hectares per thousand people and how that uh, promotes um, the basis for uh, ensuring that the town can utilize the maximum permitted parkland dedication rates as they are articulated in the planning act. Next slide. A host of other topics that are in the new introduction. Um, important to, to recognize that there are 56 recommendations and they cover a host of topics and they're highly interrelated. And um, they really need to be read together and interpreted through your parkland dedication bylaw and your parkland policy and procedure. That's uh, the way that the parks plan gets interpreted and given uh, some strength through the town's approval processes. I do talk about uh, a couple of the things that the parks plan does not do uh, that we have talked about uh, in the past at various uh, presentations. I identify the two implementing documents that you're working with. And I wanted to make sure that it was very clear that uh, council's role remains the paramount approval authority with all things related to parkland dedication. Um, it's certainly uh, council's responsibility and opportunity to approve development applications, to approve official plan amendments, to approve rezoning applications uh, and site plan approval. Um, your, your role, is parent. Uh, staff is there to assist you 
uh, through the process, but absolutely at the end of the day, council decides. Uh, next slide. The next uh, series of slides uh, go through some of the very specific recommendations that were discussed at our last meeting. And um, the first one here on recommendation five, um, I want to clarify the wording uh, to make sure that it includes the inherent interpretive flexibility that was intended. So the next few slides are going to be set up the same way. I have the issue that was raised by council, what the recommendation says uh, said at the last meeting, and how it has been adjusted uh, to provide some clarification uh, or interpretation. So this one, um, it was pretty definitive. Uh, it said the town identified the following urban parkland hierarchy. That has been softened to suggest that the town consider the identification of an urban parkland hierarchy, and it would utilize the list that was provided. Uh, but it doesn't compel the town to utilize every element. Uh, but certainly the, the intent of the list was as a tool kit of various parkland elements that are typical in an urban setting. Next slide. Recommendation 17, again, uh, the thought was the wording was too definitive and directive uh, to the town. Uh, words like will require that the town acquire parkland outside of your strategic growth areas. I've softened that wording to suggest that the town may require uh, and may consider the acquisition of parkland outside the strategic growth areas. I didn't want to take it out because I think you want the option, but it's your option and not a definitive statement that you will require uh, dedication outside the SGAs. Uh, next slide. Recommendation 31 was an interesting one. Um, uh, the way it had been written uh, was that it, it appeared that council would always be negotiating with the landowners and developers uh, in the discussion about when cash in lieu was acceptable, when land was going to be required, where that land would be, what it would look like. So that wording has been adjusted to talk about that you are the ultimate empowering uh, body to determine when you want land, when you want cash. It does also add that you may consider how you come to that decision uh, in consultation with the landowner developer, but it puts that as an opportunity rather than uh, a straight out statement that you're going to do that. You'll note that I have added a sentence, two sentences at the end. Uh, and this is one of the elements of Bill 23 that we don't have regulation on yet, but certainly the wording in the Planning Act talks about um, where a developer has made an offer of land uh, and the town does not accept it. It's not the right scale, it's not the right place. Um, whatever your concerns are, if you don't accept their offer, um, the applicant may have the right to appeal uh, that decision to the OLT. Uh, this doesn't say that they can actually do that yet. We're waiting for uh, the regulations from the province to articulate this a little bit further for us. Next slide. Recommendation 32, um, this was a recommendation previously focused only on strategic growth areas and talking about um, the identification of land dedication as the first priority other than cash in lieu. Uh, so this one has been adjusted to make it clear that that applies on a town-wide basis. It is the first priority that you accept land uh, before uh, cash in lieu or a combination of land and cash is considered. Next slide. 
Recommendation 52, I couldn't fit it on one page. Um, this is about uh, clarifying council's role and making it very clear that council always retains the ultimate decision-making authority and responsibility. Um, so on the next page, I've uh, made some adjustments to the wording. Um, first of all, I changed the order of the two points. Um, the first point uh, used to say that, that staff are going to maintain records uh, of all the lands in cash and lieu. Um, that's been changed to continue to maintain records because staff already does that. It's a requirement of the Planning Act uh, and, and staff have been doing that for, for some time. The other element is uh, been reworded that staff uh, be authorized to negotiate parkland dedication and cash in lieu in accordance with the parkland dedication bylaw, the parkland policy and procedure, and the policies of the official plan. They may be delegated the authority to have the beginnings of that negotiation, but at the end of the day, I wanted to make it also clear that that has to be ratified by council through the development approval process. Um, I think that that was implied before, but it might as well say it right out that council retains uh, the opportunity to do that through the typical approval process. Uh, and that's an important element. Uh, the negotiation element is simply utilizing the protocols that are accepted by council. And uh, those are the changes that we made uh, on the basis of the conversation at the last uh, meeting. I'm happy to uh, answer any further questions you might have. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. You have a question from Councillor Elgar to start off. Uh, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thanks for the changes you've made. Um, my con only concern right now is that the word promenade and what that is and why that is seen as parkland. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, the promenade is an element of urban park space that I've uh, seen and that works. And I want to make very clear that a promenade is not just a slightly wider sidewalk. A promenade, uh, in accordance with what I've identified in this plan, is between 6 and 20 meters in width, in addition to the sidewalk. So this is not a small element of, uh, of an urban uh, park space. And at the end of the day, uh, in the first recommendation, recommendation five, um, I have adjusted the wording to say, uh, consider uh, these elements. It doesn't mean you have to implement them. It doesn't mean you need to use them. But I've, I wanted to give you a full toolbox of elements that I have seen in urban contexts uh, through my research. Ron, where have you seen the 20 meters? That, that, is, that does sound encouraging. Where, have you, where would I be able to look at that? The one um, in the Canary District uh, in Toronto, beside the distillery district. Um, trying to remember the name of the street. It's, um, I can't remember the name of the street. However, it uh, is quite famous these days. It gets uh, photographed quite a bit because it includes um, four or five uh, installations of public art. Um, usually the view is through the public art to downtown Toronto. Um, I'm happy uh, to provide some photographs of that one for you and uh, some detail, but that one is, uh, is approximately 20 meters wide. And it includes children's uh, play areas, splash pads, uh, along with all the public art. And the sidewalk space adjacent to it uh, is also quite generous and includes spill out space for outdoor uh, seating for restaurants and so on. Well, I appreciate that. And I wouldn't mind if you give me the street because I'm one of those learners have to kind of see it 
in person. Yep. But now, is that the norm, the 20? Or, or will, would you have a lot more examples of six meters that you could show us? And I don't want to see the six, because I kind of know what they look like. But is that the uh, kind of the, would that be the top, and there aren't very many of those that we have examples of? Um, I have done an inventory of uh, these various park spaces. I will send that to staff. Um, I think I may have already at one point, um, but I will uh, get that to you and show you some examples of uh, promenade space uh, in various locations in North America. I appreciate that, and I thank you very much, and thanks for the changes you've made. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, they were good changes, I think. Thank you, Council Elder. Uh, we have a registered delegation. Mr. Sovio, welcome yeah, again. Good evening. I have uh, comments and questions. Uh, specifically, I would like to go like from the various appendices. For instance, Appendix A, it deals with the Oakville Parkland Dedication Bylaw on page 12. It states the bylaw of 2008-105 establishes parkland conveyance rate for resent residential purposes of 5% of the land proposed for development or redevelopment or at the alternative residential rate of one hectare for each 300 units. Um, I just want clarification and uh, consistency between the appendices. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, appendix B on page 5 of the bylaw number 2024-034 uh, it, it states on section 3.3, 3, uh, required parkland conveyance payment in lieu of equivalent for residential intensification. Um, point one states that the parkland dedication is based on a 5% rate or one hectare per 600 dwelling units. Um, just wondering why that has decreased or increased from 300 to 600. In addition as well, in that specific section of the bylaw, it states um, the town may require payment in lieu of a land dedication rate of 5%, as previously stated, or one hectare per thousand dwelling units, whichever is greater. So I'm just wondering uh, why there's a change from, like, for instance, 300 in initial uh, parks planning 2023 uh, document versus uh, Appendix B, the bylaw, which now states 600 dwellings, and for another area, it states one hectare per 1,000 dwelling units. Just wondering, why is there that inconsistency of uh, change happening? Um, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but one hectare per 1,000 dwellings means we put n more dwellings within a specific area, but we only get one hectare. But another area, the one hectare per 600 dwellings, less units, so therefore you still get uh, one hectare. Why, why is there 600 to 1,000 uh, dwellings? Uh, now, another area within Appendix B relates to, um, uh, I, I think, uh, page seven on part five, payment in lieu of parkland, uh, determination of land value, uh, section 6.11. It states that the valuation will be done the day before the day of the building permit. I'm just wondering as to why I think there were some letters from the developers indicating that they don't want to use that uh, day. Uh, they want to um, have another uh, time, uh, I think it's when the development application takes place versus the building permit. So why um, is there a concern uh, with the developers with respect to what's worded here in the bylaw? Another area um, concerns uh, the authority, delegation of staff. Uh, uh, the planner uh, mentioned uh, recommendation 52 that council has the final decision however uh, it's delegated uh, to town staff to negotiate uh, 
the parkland dedication or payment of the loo. Now, in order to ensure um, transparency and as well accountability, I know there's a report which is part of this bylaw that states that um, staff will report back as to the reserve, parkland reserve account. Those are dollar amounts. Unfortunately, I would like to see it go further, the report which will be presented by staff as to which properties were purchased as to as well as to the location and size. All too often I see um, parkland reserve funds or whatever allocated. As a result, we don't have uh, sufficient parkland in the area and it the developed contributes whatever amount of dollars. But those dollars invested or to other locations of the town. To me, uh, if you want specific growth areas to have X number of parkland space, it should be within that area and not somewhere else of the town. And the parkland reserve report, which will be done, should state why this has now been allocated to another location versus what the amount was originally set for with a specific area of uh, contribution by um, the developer. And lastly, I just wanted to address uh, strategic growth areas on Appendix D, I think it's page 10 of 15, and it's the calculation of payment in lieu of land. And it refers to the it's understood that the active parkland target is 2.2 hectares per thousand people. But in other areas, for instance, in the bylaw, it states uh, dwelling units. So I'm wondering if there should be some consistency in regards to uh, uh, dwelling units, how it does convert to uh, uh, people. Uh, I, I know it changes over time because depending on what is built within the town. Uh, so I just want to know if we can have a consistency in the bylaw. Is it, uh, should it be uh, hectares per people or change it to hectares per uh, dwellings? And again, on Appendix D, uh, I, I did already mention in regards to the delegation of authority. I think it's very important for ensuring transparency and accountability that staff presents a more full uh, picture, not just financial dollars, but also location of the various parkland which were purchased as well as the, uh, uh, the look, uh, those funds were they completely taken from another area which it shouldn't be. Uh, well, not that it shouldn't be, council has the final authority, but uh, as I said, if you're planning to have strategic growth areas, you want to ensure that you have parkland, especially for Midtown Oakville. It is very important. You're dumping, I shouldn't say dumping, pardon me. You're placing many, many people within a uh, confined area. And if you do not have sufficient parkland, it's not good for the well-being of its uh, residents there. And I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I hope you have a good evening. Well, thank you. Uh, you've got a number of questions there. I'm looking towards staff. I, I saw some notes being taken. Well, through you, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I took, took some, some notes, notes and I can right. start and then uh, happily be assisted by staff. Thank you very much. Um, the first uh, question was about the uh, parkland dedication rates, uh, specifically for residential. And um, the speaker, made some good points and some good questions. So what I'm gonna tell you about the residential rates is that they are established in the Planning Act and we are using uh, the maximum rates permitted by the Planning Act. So the 5% uh, of gross land area residential is the baseline rate uh, for residential development. And that typically comes into play uh, in the more typical established residential neighborhoods in Oakville. The 5% of gross land area gets you the most parkland uh, you can get in the lower density areas 
of the town. The second um, rate for residential is split into two. One hectare per 600 dwelling units is the first one for the dedication of land. That comes into play in higher density areas in the strategic growth areas. Um, and that's for the dedication of land. If the town were to take cash in lieu of land, the rate is one hectare per thousand. So it's a significant difference if you take land versus cash. So that has to be part of the consideration um, when the decisions are made about whether you're accepting land or cash or some combination of those two things. There is a third element to, uh, to the residential alternative rate, and that is a maximum cap uh, that comes into play, again, within the higher density areas, and that's the 10% of land area for uh, sites that are five hectares or less, and 15% uh, of land area where the sites are greater than five hectares. So those three things work together and they come into play as density increases. Um, it is the numbers that we are given in the planning act. And the goal of the parkland dedication bylaw is to ensure that the town is able to utilize the maximum permissible by the planning act. The second question was about when is the cash in lieu uh, calculated? Obviously it only comes into play when you're accepting cash in lieu, which is not the first priority. Uh, the Planning Act tells us that under section 42, it's the day before a building permit is issued. Um, I don't speak for the development industry as to why they don't like that, notwithstanding that that's what it says in the Planning Act. I might um, postulate that it's because land value, the closer you get to a building permit, the higher the land value becomes. So they would prefer the calculation. And again, I'm just postulating on this, uh, be done at a time when the land value is less. As simple as that. That's my only explanation for that. Um, the delegation element, I think um, I've spoken about earlier in the presentation, um, there are a host of administrative elements of the bylaw that uh, if council wishes to, to, to be involved in all of that, they certainly can be involved in all of that. Um, but there are uh, certain parts of it that um, you probably will rely on staff to do, keeping in mind that you will always have the opportunity uh, to weigh in when decisions are made. And fundamentally, the decision and the discussion about when it's land versus when it's cash. I think uh, other elements um, that will likely be within the parkland policy and procedure will make sure that the priority for land uh, is identified. And that will be part of the marching orders uh, for staff uh, to work with the development industry in coming up with um, a proposal to bring before council for approval. Um, the last one was about the relationship of all of these numbers, whether it's land area, whether it's cash, uh, what, how we're talking about the 2.2 hectares per thousand. And absolutely, it's a fair comment to say we're utilizing a, a bunch of different measures. And that's because the province gives us a bunch of different measures that we have to utilize in order to utilize the Planning Act to achieve a parkland dedication, dedication or cash in lieu. The 2.2 hectares per thousand 
is a town-wide number. Um, certainly, uh, as densities go up in your strategic growth areas, you cannot achieve 2.2 hectares per thousand people. Um, however, the goal is that you have 2.2 hectares per thousand people on a town-wide basis. And that means uh, augmenting the supply of parkland throughout the town. And we go back to the concept of the campus of parks, that you have a robust uh, hierarchy of various types of parkland that do various things from enjoyment of uh, the environment right up to the uh, urban park spaces that are tend to be somewhat smaller and also much more heavily used. Uh, and that requires a different design protocol. So we are using different measures, um, but there are different reasons why each measure uh, is utilized uh, throughout not only the Parkland Education Bylaw, but also the uh, Parks Plan 2031, as well as the Parkland procedure and policy and procedure uh, document that uh, is forthcoming. I hope that I answered um, the questions. Um, I don't know if staff has anything to add to that. Looks like you did a very good job. I see a nodding of heads and uh, very clear and concise. Thank you very much. Councillor Chisholm, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, just for uh, I'm struggling with this uh, this idea of promenades, and in my years of, of looking at parks and working in parks and so forth, there seems to be a, uh, a non-definition of what a promenade uh, park is. And is there a way of qualifying or, or measuring, Ron, with respect to uh, our parkland dedication? Uh, I have challenges with including that in in our overall park. Uh, uh, inventory uh, promenades because it seems to be a very loose term with respect to um, what is uh, the purpose of promenades and what they do and the size and so forth. So how do we how do we put that put that in a category somewhere so we we have clarity on that? Um, thank you, and through Mr. Chairman, um, I did uh, include uh, in the document in an appendix. Um, some guidelines for what a promenade would be. Um, I just want to get you the correct appendix number. Appendix uh, four. Um, and you might want to look in that. Um, appendix three, I've also included some examples uh, of various elements of the parkland hierarchy. And um, to go back to the councillor Elgar, it's Mill Street in Toronto, in the Canary District. So it again, the way that it's worded, I've given you a, a toolbox full of different park typologies that are are identified as within urban areas. It will be up to um, the town. Uh, during your secondary planning uh, and development approval processes to determine which elements of that toolbox you wish to apply in any specific uh, location. Um, it's not a requirement. It's simply an option for consideration. Answers your questions. Councillor Chisholm, good stuff. Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you, and thank you for answering all of our uh, earlier questions in such a, a really succinct uh, presentation. Um, just a, a few follow ups. So, when uh, an SGA establishes a public realm or a, a parks plan within the SGA, are you suggesting then we have the opportunity to? to determine whether or not promenade would be uh, one of the elements that uh, qualifies uh, under the parkland dedication bylaw? 
I just want to be clear. It could, uh, but I would expect that um, the SGAs will all be um, subject to secondary plans. And a promenade is a large element. Um, and if there is to be one, it should be vetted through the secondary plan process in order to be appropriate and deemed appropriate uh, within any given secondary plan. Um, again, you don't have to have the full array of uh, urban park spaces uh, within a secondary plan, but that's really part of the planning process. Um, so thank you for that. So I'm gonna just look over to Mr. Charles. Can you just confirm that, because um, sometimes I'm not quite sure if our OPA is the secondary plan or the master plan or where it's all gonna fit in, is, uh, is, is that your understanding of where we would determine promenades would be? Are we at the point in a, an OPA or the public realm uh, master plan that that's where we'll determine the promenades may or may not be used? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. That's okay. when we do it. All right, and so we do not have to have, it is a toolbox, it's not necessarily a requirement, but once we put it in, it's then, it would then count as parkland dedication? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I look at the the the, ar the array of, of park types kind of as a menu, and, and you get to pick what it is that you'd like to use within uh, the different areas or, or SGAs, and what is the most appropriate parkland type based on the context that that's there. That's how I, I would see them being being used. So if there's elements uh, such as promenades which aren't or don't lend themselves to to the context, then simply they wouldn't be used. We'd be looking at a variety of other park types to ensure that we're achieving the parkland goal. And and would we have the flexibility to insist on more softscape in a promenade? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. Uh, okay. th those are the types of things that we have to go through and to detail design. We wouldn't do that at the secondary planning level. We would do that as we get down down the. Uh, another level. Okay, so thank you very much for that clarification. When you first stood up, you talked about a change that used the words within the area of development. Can you just direct us to where that was in the? In the area of development? Uh, certainly, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, within the uh, Appendix D, which is the procedure, and if you have the paper copy of the addendum, it's page 30, and it is eight sub one. Thank you for clarifying that for me. And my last question is to, to the lawyers. There's a section that talks about, and we've had presentations before, about some of the challenges, whether it's a pop or a strata, et cetera, um, that there's an obligation to maintain those, uh, the pops and uh, the strata. Will that be in perpetuity in the, in the legal agreement? Is that like a forever commitment? I'm just recognizing we have uh, condo owners in town that uh, raise questions about their maintenance fees and, and their obligations to maintain certain things. Is, is it our intent that their obligation is in perpetuity, whether it becomes a condo corp or some other form of real estate holding? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, certainly we would um, negotiate the most um, um, beneficial provision possible for the town, but there are certain uh, rules against perpetuity, uh, legal rules that we may uh, be constrained um, uh, in, in those negotiations. So um, we wouldn't want to uh, uh, impose anything that was um, beyond the confines of, uh, of the law. Thanks very much for your answer. Uh, Councillor Adams. Thanks very much. I was just chatting with Councillor Noel about um, how do we treat currently the lands that have uh, trails on the pipelines in North Oakville and so forth. Where, how would those get counted uh, in, in this kind of a park situation? Do they, do they get counted? Um, depends on the ownership and whether we 
just have access to the land? Um, you know, where, do, where does it fall? To you, Mr. Chair, uh, and I will turn to my colleague, Mr. Mark, in case I go too far astray here. But uh, the trails and are, are part of the, the parkland um, calculation. They are dedicated at the time through through subdivision. They're, they don't qualify as the 2.2 because the 2.2 is related to active parkland. As we've been seeing post-pandemic and even during the, the pandemic, uh, the trails and, and the more passive areas of town were used with much more vigor, I'd say. Uh, so those are areas that we're continuously looking to see how can we uh, enhance them, uh, how do we uh, operate them. In some cases where they aren't a pipeline, we, we have easements across them so they may not be uh, part of the overall um, calculation, but it does feed into the, the whole campus of parks. It's, it's a different element of, of park land. So, yeah, I, I recognize it's obviously it's a different kind of space, um, and I just wondered how it would relate to the, um, the, the POPS um, system, I think is the right acronym, um, where it's somebody, I think in most cases it's somebody else's land and we just get a, an allowance to use the surface to put a trail over, and so our residents enjoy the access to the space, but we don't own it. Uh, and, and through you, Mr. Chair, it, it, again, it's, um, it, it depends on the ownership. Uh, it depends if we're getting it de uh, delegated to the town through a, as a buffer, like for example, as a top of bank along uh, a hazard feature uh, where we have them. Uh, so for example, North Oakville, it doesn't constitute part of the Master Parkland Agreement. It is over and above that. Okay. We get the straight 64 and a half and, and, that, and that's, that's it. Um, as active parkland. And so we get the rest of it, NHS, et cetera, and the trail suite of the NHS, that, that continues to be used as parkland. Um, that said, I don't know if Chris wants to add to it. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the closest analogy I could provide you, Councillor, is the uh, Ontario Hydro One corridors that we have through town. Uh, they are owned by Hydro One. We have a master parkland agreement with Hydro One, which stipulates what we can and cannot do along the corridors. So um, that's an instance where we do have passive parkland uh, contributing to our overall parkland system, but it's owned by another entity and we have an agreement that says the rules of use for that, um, for that system. And in that case, we, they could theoretically they could take it away from us because there is no there's no agreement that said we have it forever uh, you can't take it away and and by the way you have to maintain it that is correct which would be the case in a development situation where we might if we were going to take some uh, public or privately owned public space we would have some agreement in place that would say and by the way you have to maintain it at some agreed upon level or at least provide notice if you're gonna take it away from us at some point in time in the future. And, and we would then have a negotiated process Correct. by which we would deal with that. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Elder. Uh, thank you, Thiru. Mr. Chair, a question back to uh, Mr. Gates. Uh, uh, private open space that is used by the public or sorry, good, good God, that's bad, eh? <laughs> okay, we're, we're rolling back, it's late. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, um, back to the POPs for one moment. What can we negotiate? You said we can't do a regular transaction into perpetuity. So when, when, the legalese talk, at any time, I guess the private could come back and say public's not welcome. That could happen? It wasn't meant to be a trick question. It's just, I no, think. No, <laughs> we, no, no and, and certainly, uh, Council, we don't, we, we don't take it uh, as such. And by all means, I consider it a supreme uh, compliment to be uh, uh, compared to my predecessor, Mr. Gates. Um, so um, we have um, Mr. Um, Biggert, who's uh, monitoring uh, the, the meeting um, remotely. And his, his uh, indication is 
Um, the fact is that it will have to be negotiated between the town and the developer who will maintain it. It's up to the developer. We may have concerns with the length of the obligation. In short, it's a complex answer and, and, and cannot be answered on the fly, but there are um, uh, commercial limitations to what you can oppose by way of an agreement. And, and so I can only really uh, reiterate what I've said, and I understand that it's not completely uh, it's not complete or satisfactory, but we would negotiate the strongest deal that we could, uh, bearing in mind the, the longer term that we don't want to be in that position. Well, the reason I want the clarification, I want everybody around this table to fully understand what is happening when we talk about POP. So I, I actually appreciate the honesty and the accuracy in that statement. Thanks very much. Okay. Councillor Noel. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on uh, Councillor Adams' question um, just for a little more clarity. So the, the uh, Hydro One lands, it's, that's clear. They own those lands. They reserve the right to sell them. They've sold them in the past since I've been a councillor. But what about, for example, the Trans-Canada Pipeline? So when Metro Ontario, as an example, developed a good part of Ward 5 and Ward 6 in years gone by, uh, a large, per there, were, there are a couple parks that were developed on top of Trans-Canada corridors. Uh, theoretically, they were owned, those corridors were owned by Metro Ontario at some point. Would those have been part of the Parkland dedication? Would they be in the future? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. The area that you're speaking about, Councillor Knoll, they are owned by the town of Oakville. They were taken from through Metro Ontario back to subdiv subdivision agreement days um, for at encumbered cost because there's a pipeline beneath it, um, they have an easement over those areas. So it's the town of Oakville property with TransCanada having an easement underneath it for their pipeline. So they cannot just order us off our own property. They have an easement there that we have to respect right. in terms of how we're maintaining the property. <clears throat> but in terms of the dedication of that land, would it be c calculated at the same rate as unencumbered land, for example? Much different. It would be. And I think, going back in time, I think at that time it was uh, 50%. Oh, okay. was the uh, Parkland dedication. We took it at that time back in the early early 90s. Okay, and can you just clarify, uh, answer your question for me. Um, the um, the parkette, the promenade, I believe it's a promenade that runs through Morrison Village. Is That is a promenade, technically? You know the one I'm referring to? The um, In Morrison Village uh, on um, on Sixth Line, there's a, there's a linear park that yes. runs through the park. Is that is that considered a promenade? I was just thinking about mostly to help Councillor Elgar understand to, to see go and see a promenade in the... I'm not sure we classify that as a promenade. We have two promenades in North Oakville being uh, George Savage Promenade and the Preserve Promenade, okay. which um, are there. I'm not sure the one you're speaking to we refer to as a promenade. Yeah, it's actually, it's on the corner of the promenade and the greenery. Right. But you're not, you can't clarify if it's a promenade or not. I don't believe it's called a promenade. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Neural. Did you want to move? Did you want to move this item? I'd be happy to move it, your 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 chairmanship, your chairman, your chairman, sir. Move. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Councillor Noel. Your worship, I didn't want to that. He's still here. Moved by Councillor Noel that the uh, Town's Parks Plan 2031 provided in Appendix A to the report from the Planning Services Department, Parks and Open Space Department, and Finance Department dated April 2nd, 2024, be endorsed. Two, that Bylaw 2024-034, Parkland Dedication Bylaw, as provided in Appendix B, be passed. That the Parkland Dedication Procedure attached as Appendix D be received and for that prior to the finalization of the land acquisition strategy, strategy, staff continue to monitor land acquisition opportunities within the town's strategic growth areas and where acquisition supports community and infrastructure needs, staff will present options to council for consideration. All in favor? And that is carried. We have dealt with 7-3. That takes us to the...
That takes us to the uh, 9.1, the Heritage Advisory Committee minutes. Councillor Duddock moves that the following recommendation pertaining to item 4.1 of the Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee minutes from its meeting on March 26, 2024 be approved and the remainder of the minutes be received. 4.1. Heritage Permit Application HP00824-42-20 262 King Street, construction of a two-story addition that Heritage Permit Application as named above for the construction of a new two-story addition at 262 King Street as attached in Appendix B to the report dated March 12, 2024 from planning services be approved subject to the following that final details on the windows doors trim cladding materials and paint colors be submitted to heritage planning staff for final approval and two that this heritage permit expire two years from the date of final approval of council council how do you vote on this one all in favor and that is carried at this time I'd like to rise moved by councillor Lischina, that this committee rise from committee of the whole and report moved by councillor Lischina. all in favor and that is carried i rise and report that the committee of the whole has met and has made recommendations on consent items 4.1 4.2 and 4.3 discussion items 7.1 7.2 and 7.3 and the Heritage Advisory Committee minutes 9.1 as noted by the clerk. And that the report and recommendations of the Committee of the Whole be approved, moved by Councillor Elgar and seconded by Councillor Adams. <laughs> All in favor. And that is carried. Does anybody have any new business? of an emergency congratulatory or condolence. Seeing none. Happy birthday, Mayor Burton. I'll, I'll bring that one up. Hope you're having a wonderful time. So in, for consideration and reading of the bylaws. I am, and thank you very much for your good wishes. <laughs> Wish we were with you. <laughs> for consideration and reading the bylaws moved by I wish you were here too. I think you'd be amazed. <laughs> Councillor Chisholm and seconded by Councillor Longo that the bylaws noted be passed. 12.1 bylaw 2024034, uh, a bylaw to require the conveyance of parkland or the payment of in lieu of parkland pursuant to the Planning Act, regard uh, further to item 7.2. 12.2 bylaw 2024-066, a bylaw to declare that certain land is not subject to part lot control. Blocks 1, 5, 6, 7, 12, 14, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 23 of plan 20M-1258 and block 205, plan 20M-1255, Martillac Estates Inc. and 12.3, which is bylaw 2024-062, a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of a meeting of council. Madam Clerk, is that on the following on the uh, preceding items? All in favor, and that is carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We are now adjourned at 9:40.